Uh, welcome everyone to um, the second day of the third uh, Family, Caregiver, Family Caregiving Advisory Council meeting. Um, I want to welcome everyone. Um, and before we get underway, I want to see if Lance Robertson um, is here and has any, any remarks or words you'd like to say um, to all of us. Lance? Hey, Greg. Yes, I am here. And um, as always, um, appreciate an opportunity to say a few words and to just uh, continually thank the committee for the great work. And um, again, I can't express um, accurately just how grateful we are as your federal partner to really see this coming together. And I know yesterday was a good day. I got to hear all of Scott's uh, remarks. And again, we love the Hartford Foundation. They're such a fabulous partner. So Scott, thank you. And again, my best to your leadership. And just, uh, we always, always are grateful for the Hartford support. Um, most see it directly in this effort, but as I know, there's so many other tentacles of connection that are of high value. So thank you, Scott. I missed uh, Kitty and Dr. Nadesh because of another appointment, but I caught back up on the PowerPoint. Looked like some great information. And of course, capping off yesterday was Lynn with ARP, who has a tiny bit of experience on caregiving. Um, so I'm glad she was able to weigh in. Um, I'm kidding. We all, we all know Lynn and she has just been a master, a pillar at really helping um, um, provide great information. And again, I'm, I'm thankful that she's part of this group. And of course, today's agenda is exciting as well. I don't know, Greg, will go over that. Jill, we've all known for a long time at the Arch, at the Arch and um, just the great work that she's always been uh, doing and continues then to feed into our collective work. And then Joe and Scott doing some um, data analysis for us today. And then Greg's going to lead us again through the driver component. So, you know, another great afternoon. So thank you again for taking the time to be a part of this. Happy Thursday afternoon to all of you. I hope it's been a good day so far. Um, I mentioned yesterday just, you know, all the opportunities that um, I really try to take advantage of to brag about the work that you guys are doing because we're just so grateful and it's so important and it's so timely. So, you know, as one example, I was on the, I was on a uh, town hall this morning with um, the Rhode Island governor, Governor Ramonda, and we were um, talking about, amongst many other things, family caregivers and a personal experience that she's gone through. So again, I know it resonates with everyone, including the governor of Rhode Island, um, as recently as this morning. Um, you know, also, as I mentioned, or I think I referenced yesterday, you know, we have a weekly state unit on aging director calls. So we gather the SUA state leaders across the country every week, every Wednesday. And if, if Greg's schedule permits over the next week or two, we're going to try to have Greg do a brief out on how things are going because that group is of course very interested and we all know they're the ones that administer the um, caregiver program through the Americans Act. So those folks are also um, just very grateful for the work that we're doing and we'll make sure that they have a nice update um, from Greg himself in the very near future. Uh, we also plan to report out to this committee when the timing is right on what the $100 million um, supplemental funds have done for family caregivers. As I mentioned to you yesterday, of the 1.2 billion that ACLs received through both supplementals, um, 100 million of that was directed to support the, further support the family caregiver program. So it'll be good to share with all of you what those outcomes begin to look like. And then finally, um, just if you aren't signed up for ACL's blogs, I hope you'll sort of pay attention to some of the things we're pushing out. Um, obviously we do all we can to support the roughly three dozen different programs that we offer for older adults and people with disabilities at ACL. We did put out a blog yesterday, um, Older Americans Act Month 2020, different uh, celebration, same goal. And I hope you'll take a, an opportunity to take a look at that. And, and um, that was, I thought, a, a good and timely one. And then um, on the 1st of May, we put out one that really focused on supporting caregivers. And again, another worthy, you know, 60 second read. But I hope that all of you are signed up for those. If, if you're not, you can jump on acl.gov and sign up for our push outs. But, with that, again, thanks, Greg, for an opportunity to say hello to everybody. Thanks uh, uh, for everyone's time this afternoon. Look forward to a great conversation. Back to you, Greg. Great. Thank you, Lance. Um, and before we um, get underway with just a quick um, recap of yesterday and um, any follow-on thoughts that you all might have from yesterday, I want to ask Cheryl to do a quick roll call. Um, this way, it'll give us a final opportunity to check microphones. Um, and then we'll run through some housekeeping and look forward to the rest of the day. So, Cheryl? Wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And if we'll start off with our chair, Lance Robertson. Hey, good afternoon. Who just, Thank you. <laughs> who just spoke. <clears throat> our co-chairs, Casey Shillam. Yes, good morning. I'm here. 
Good morning. Alan Stevens. Hello, yes, I'm here. Nancy Murray. I'm here. Our non-federal members, Ben Bledsoe. Present. Joe Caldwell. Here. Diane Caradu. I'm here. James Cheeley. Good afternoon. Gisela Dolan. Here. Brenda Gallant. Here. Catherine Alicia Georges. Here. Rhonda Montgomery. Here. James Martha. Deborah Stone Walls. Here. Teresa Tanu. Good day, everyone. Carol Zerniel. Here. Thank you. And then our federal members, Elizabeth Darling or alternate Liliana Hernandez. Linda Davis. Here. Thank you. Bruce Fink. Good afternoon. Melissa Gerald is unable to attend. Melissa Harris. Helen Lamont. Good afternoon, I'm here. Tamara Mays. Lisa McGuire. Here. Jan Newsom. <clears throat> Katie O'Callaghan. Or alternate Diane Mitchell. Hector Ortiz. Rosemary Payne. Good afternoon. Mark Vafiades. Yes, hi, I'm here. Thank you. Joan Weiss. Good afternoon, I'm here. Thank you. And we'll move to our Nashby colleagues. Wendy Fox Gray. Here. Kitty Purrington. Good afternoon. And if we have our John A. Hartford Foundation colleagues, Ronnie Snyder. I'm here. Scott Bain. Hi, everyone. Health and Aging Policy Fellows, Laurel Taylor. Trailer, sorry. I'm here. I'm here. Kelly O'Malley. I'm here. Okay, and I see we have Hector Ortiz. Hector Ortiz. Okay, he's probably still connecting audio. Thank you, Greg, that's all I have. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping um, things, very similar to yesterday, but for those members of the public who may be viewing. Um, for, for, for our council members, if you can and you want to, um, we'd love to see your face. So if you feel comfortable turning on your video, that would be great. Um, and then otherwise mute uh, your lines when you're not speaking. Um, the chat function um, is available uh, for members of the public to provide input. Um, this is really um, valuable information. It's not lost once the once the meeting ends. It's all captured, and we are able to see your thoughts um, real time as as they're happening. Although keep in mind that we may not be able to respond to everything. Um, yesterday we had a, a fairly good size um, audience from uh, members of the public on, and um, the the comments were coming in very quickly. But they are captured, and the information is 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 incredibly useful to us. So thank you. Um, we are going to be, we're um, council members, we're going to have one poll later on um, in today's meeting, and that will be a poll that um, looks at what our 
the, the format of our future meetings will be like for the rest of this year, whether we're gonna do full council meetings only or subcommittee meetings or a mix thereof. So as we're working through today, and as we see the progress that we make, um, we'll be giving some thought to that and, um, and uh, we'll, we'll come to a decision about how we proceed for the rest of the year. Um, we also, um, as with yesterday, we had a couple of really um, interesting presentations that were designed to provide council members with some deeper, deeper dives on information that we're considering um, as far as the development of the national strategy um, and the um, initial report to Congress. We have two more really great, um, very rich discussions today. Um, as, we're, as we're listening to the two presentations today, um, give some thought to additional topics that you all would like to see or hear about um, in future meetings like this. Um, because Wendy um, and her NASHP team and I um, are more than happy to, and we, we want to be able to, um, as, as you all are doing your work and developing the national strategy um, and, and looking at recommendations to include in the report, um, we want you to have the most up-to-date information and the opportunity to really um, explore certain subject matters in more depth. And the way we can do that is in meetings and presentations like this. So as you think of other topics that you'd like to get more depth on, please be ready to discuss those towards the end of the day today. And of course, anytime um, after the meeting is over. Um, we have, a, like I said, two really great presentations today, one on respite. Um, by um, Jill Kagan with the Arch National Respite Network and Resource Center. Um, and then later on, we're gonna delve into a bit of um, information on the current state of data gathering and research around family caregiving, because that has been another topic um, that has come up frequently in subcommittee discussions um, as we think about what recommendations we may need to make and how that all fits into the development of the national strategy. And so we're very excited to have Dr. Scott Beach and um, the council's own Joe Caldwell um, providing some, uh, some background and opportunity for discussion on that. Um, does, does anyone have any questions or any follow-up information or ideas or thoughts from yesterday's discussion uh, before we turn it over to Jill? Okay, hearing none. We will have plenty of opportunity for discussion. We are also gonna be working later on in the last hour of our meeting today. We're gonna to spend some time diving into the driver diagram. And so hopefully uh, you all weren't so um, exhausted from yesterday sitting in front of a computer screen for three hours that you couldn't spend a little more time looking at one and hopefully giving some thought to the driver diagram. So we are gonna be um, diving into that. Um, at around um, 2.45 Eastern time. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn the, the uh, floor over to Jill Kagan um, for who will lead us through a discussion on respite. So Jill. Thank you so much, Greg, and welcome. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I wanna start out by thanking Administrator Robertson, the council, uh, Greg and Lori at ACL and Wendy at Nash B for the great opportunity to be able to talk to you today about respite. Uh, ARCH has existed since 1990 as a National Respite Network and Resource Center. Uh, and since 2009, we've been very privileged to house the ACL funded Lifespan Respite Technical uh, Assistance Center. And in, in this capacity, I'm really honored to be here uh, with you all today. And on behalf of the Respite Net Network, I want to say I'm very grateful uh, for the commitment and expertise you all bring uh, to this important uh, work. Uh, next slide, please. I want to start out by commending ACL and the Council for taking a serious lifespan approach uh, in your deliberations. Um, we certainly all acknowledge and are working towards serving uh, the hugely growing need among family caregivers of older adults uh, for support. But caregiving has been and remains uh, undeniably a lifespan issue. Uh, the Caregiving in the U.S. report uh, just released last week by the National Alliance for Caregiving and AARP uh, confirms uh, that a majority of family caregivers are caring for someone between the ages of 18 and 75. Uh, and there are nearly 14 million children with special health care needs uh, who require a high level of care and are, are receiving that care from parents uh, or other relatives. Uh, 
What's noteworthy too is that increasingly many of those who are caring for children are also caring for an older adult uh, family member. And I just want to briefly mention that uh, the one million youth caregivers uh, who are out there caring for parents with chronic illnesses, siblings with disabilities, or even their grandparents. So needless to say, uh, we are extremely grateful for the Council's lifespan approach. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I'm going to start by defining respite so that we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, describe where and how respite's provided. Talk a little bit about benefits of respite. Uh, some of the access issues, uh, the barriers that may keep so many caregivers from using respite. And then hopefully if I have some time, I'll lay out some possible strategies uh, for overcoming these barriers that uh, I offer for consideration uh, by the council. Next slide, please. Uh, the definition that I'm offering to you today is included in the Lifespan Respite Care Act. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Lifespan Respite Care Program uh, in a few minutes. But that definition, um, I think, has served us very well over the years because it's broad and inclusive. And the definition is the actual planned or emergency care provided to a child or adult with special needs in order to provide temporary relief to family caregivers who are caring for that child uh, or adult. Uh, next slide, please. As diverse as family caregivers are, so are the types of respite that are available to them. Uh, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Respite can be provided in home or out of home. Uh, In-home models may in involve consumer direction where families hire and train their own providers uh, from their networks of family and community supports, or they can rely on uh, paid providers from home care agencies or community-based volunteer programs that uh, may send someone into the home to provide companionship care. Uh, Out-of-home respite may be provided in adult daycare settings or childcare settings. Uh, in facility-based settings such as hospitals, nursing homes, or assisted living, uh, in freestanding community-based respite programs or in faith-based uh, settings. Uh, it may be provided by disability or aging service organizations. Uh, it can be provided in the respite provider's own home, uh, another family's home, uh, or in a foster home or other group home um, type setting. It's important to note that while we do have some research that shows families prefer a consumer directed respite in their own homes that is person and family centered, uh, they most likely will have needs for other respite options at different times, depending on their ever changing uh, caregiving needs. Uh, and then uh, added to that is that respite may also uh, not only be needed on a planned basis, but in an emergency situation. And this can certainly also affect uh, the respite setting. And, and we're seeing that right now with the advent of the pandemic. Uh, of course, not all of these options are currently available. Uh, our, our network is actively engaged, meeting almost uh, regularly every week um, to share how they're continuing to support caregivers through uh, non-traditional types of respite, <laughs> uh, like Facebook groups, online support groups, uh, online activities that may keep the care recipients engaged so the caregiver can have some time to themselves, uh, care packages delivered to their homes, uh, regular check-in phone calls, uh, and many more uh, ways. Uh, as I said, it's certainly not the traditional way of providing respite, but we know that families are in greater need right now uh, than ever uh, for that kind of support. Uh, in fact, knowing uh, the value of respite, some states uh, have actually designated respite providers as essential workers. Uh, and if providers are continuing to offer in-home respite when families are uh, accepting and willing, um, they are, our network providers are sharing how they're doing so, um, taking all safety precautions so that the rest of the network can be kept informed about what's happening around the country. What's patently clear is that things have changed dramatically in how respite is provided. And we may not be able to return to offering the same full range of respite options. And the, the field is changing as we 
speak. Um, ARCH just recently convened a work group uh, to begin to develop some guidelines uh, through a deliberative process that will uh, assist our network and our providers to reopen respite um, as safely as possible and adjust to the uh, changing landscape. Uh, next slide, please. We all know, all of us know here in our hearts that respite uh, is beneficial, but we know it from the research uh, as well uh, that respite may help improve family caregiver stress levels. Uh, and it's certainly been uh, documented well in the research that high stress is directly affected to uh, poor physical and emotional health outcomes. Um, we also know that respite can uh, improve family be well being by allowing family caregivers to set aside time for focusing on other family relationships. And the whole issue of social isolation. Um, family caregivers are already more prone to social isolation because of the nature of their caregiving tasks. Uh, and this is only intensified uh, during the current pandemic. Uh, and again, we know that social isolation is a, a very strong predictor of poor physical uh, and mental health outcomes. And, so we do have to be creative about how respite can still help to reduce social isolation when the caregiver or the care recipient can't even leave the home. Uh, and I mentioned all the ways that some of our respite network members are doing that. Um, the respite field is still on the front lines. Uh, In-home respite is still happening in some places and these connections may be the only ones uh, that families have right now with the outside world. We also know in terms of benefits of respite that respite may contribute to reduced hospital costs by helping to avoid readmissions uh, or helping to avoid emergency room visits uh, and may even help avoid or delay more costly out of home placements. And let's not forget that respite is very important to the care recipient uh, as well to give them a break um, from the constant caregiving uh, situation. Uh, next slide, please. Despite all of these benefits of respite, the sad news is, is that too few family caregivers are using it or able to access it. Uh, the caregiving in the US study uh, that I cited earlier, was cited yesterday as well, uh, found that this hasn't changed much uh, in the last uh, five years when the study was uh, last done, that 14% of family caregivers, only 14% are reporting having used respite though 38% feel it would be very helpful. Uh, of course, caregivers who are providing higher hours of care or in high intensity care situations are slightly more likely to have used respite, but also more likely to see uh, the helpfulness of the service. We also know that for respite to be the most effective, uh, it really should be delivered as early in the caregiving experience as possible. Uh, but we also know that many caregivers wait until they have a crisis uh, to seek respite or to ask for help uh, of any kind. Um, on top of this, the, we do know from research increasingly that the dosage of respite, the amount of respite uh, that family caregivers uh, receive is directly related to increased and longer lasting uh, benefits. Uh, in fact, a, the recent evaluation of the National Family Caregiver Support Program uh, found that four hours of respite weekly uh, helped reduce perceived caregiver burden. Uh, and this really corroborates um, earlier research by Steve Zaret and others about a minimum amount of respite that's most helpful. Um, next slide, please. We've also learned from the research and from the field, uh, what are the barriers? What's keeping from so many family caregivers from not uh, using respite? Uh, and while the caregiving in the U.S. study didn't examine what all the barriers were, again, we have a lot of information about what they are. Uh, the first one is a limited amount of funding, public funding for formal respite services. Um, it's just too limited to allow all families to have a respite and especially to have the amount of respite uh, that they so desperately need. Uh, then there's also the personal cost. Uh, the personal cost of respite for the family can be prohibitive, uh, especially when the care recipient doesn't qualify for existing public programs 
Uh, the family may be faced with high medical and daily living needs that are uh, consuming a, a significant portion of the family budget. Uh, and as we also heard yesterday from the uh, RFI commissioned by ACL, uh, that financial security is a huge issue for family caregivers because so many have had to give up an income um, to stay home and provide care. And so if this is a situation, respite is just seen as a luxury that falls off uh, of the household budget. However, even when the family has the resources to pay for respite, in many situations, they can't find the providers. They can't find providers who are qualified or trained uh, to deal with the unique medical or behavioral needs of their loved ones. Or maybe they can't find the providers or the respite programs uh, they need at the times that they need them. Um, overnight respite, evening respite, extended stay respite options are still an extremely short supply. And then we layer on top of all of these barriers, uh, the fact that many caregivers are reluctant to ask for help. Um, they may feel guilt or fear about leaving a loved one with someone else. Or an issue that we're all also very aware of, that caregivers don't self-identify as caregivers. Um, they're just the, the, it's their parent or their spouse. And so they don't seek out services uh, identified as caregiver services, such as respite, that might be helpful. Uh, other access barriers can include a, a lack of information uh, about how or where to uh, get respite or uh, respite funding sources. Uh, and then transportation uh, barriers, especially in rural areas, um, that keep uh, many family caregivers from being able to access respite. And then we have the multiple and siloed funding streams uh, with confusing, and el confusing eligibility and criteria that can really make it very difficult for family caregivers to navigate the system and figure out where to go. Next slide, please. These various funding sources in some ways are a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing that we have a variety of public and private funding sources available for respite and we're fortunate to be able to offer many of those to families. But each one is riddled with restrictions or barriers uh, that may put them out of reach for many caregivers. Um, for example, um, Medicaid home and community-based waivers, which are the largest source of federal funding for respite, um, often have very strict eligibility criteria. Uh, and on top of that, there are many, many states have long waiting lists uh, for services. Uh, in fact, waiting lists have increased in 23 states uh, just since 2017. On a more positive note, uh, CMS recently issued regulations that now allow Medicare Advantage plans uh, to offer non-medical supplemental benefits, including respite and adult day services. And, and this is extremely encouraging development, uh, but we really don't know yet how widely available the respite benefit uh, will be because it is optional for plans um, to offer that. Uh, and then, of course, there are all the other funding sources that I know you're very familiar with. The National Family Caregiver Support Program um, that's administered by local area agencies on aging uh, for caregivers caring for someone over the age of 60, anyone uh, of any age with Alzheimer's or other dementias. Uh, and now uh, parents who are caring for adult children with disabilities, as well as grandparents caring for grandchildren. So over the years, the Family Caregiver Support program has had a wider reach, uh, and that's been extremely uh, welcomed by family caregivers. Um, the Veterans Administration, you're all very familiar with the, the Veterans Caregiver uh, program, um, which hopefully the VA will be able to roll out uh, to veterans from all errors uh, in the near future. There's state-funded respite programs. Many states for many years have had uh, state-funded respite programs for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Increasingly, states are instituting line items in their budget for respite for people with Alzheimer's. So um, there is state funding available as well. Again, not uniformly available. Uh, and in the private sector, there are many disability and aging organizations um, that help families pay 
uh, for respite, like Easter Seals or um, the ARC or the Alzheimer's Association. So we're very grateful for the support that they provide uh, to, their, to their constituencies as well. And for the majority of family caregivers, there's always self-pay, <laughs> if that's a possibility. Um, and for the small minority of individuals who have long-term care insurance, um, many insurance plans, uh, long-term care insurance plans will pay for respite as well. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to just, again, uh, without being too presumptuous, uh, lay out a few suggestions uh, for improving access to respite for council co consideration that I leave to you uh, for further discussion. Uh, next slide, please. I would uh, start off by offering examination of the federal lifespan respite per care program as a model uh, for state adoption. Um, the federal lifespan respite program is unique from other federal caregiver initiatives in that it was designed specifically uh, to address all of the barriers that I talked about before. Affordability, uh, provider access and capacity, all of those issues. Um, by he helping states to build coordinated statewide respite systems uh, that serve all family caregivers across the age and disability spectrum. Next slide, please. The program is currently funded at just over $6 million, so it's a very small program. Uh, and this limited funding requires that ACL administer it through a competitive process um, to states. It is not available to states uh, on a formula grant. Not every state receives funding. Uh, in fact, since the program was first funded in 2009, uh, 37 states in DC uh, have received at, at least one grant. Um, and currently, uh, Lori can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think there are about 20 active uh, state grants. Um, states are required to engage in activities that address all four of these uh, required uses of funds that are displayed on the slide here, um, including uh, developing and enhancing a coordinated statewide system of respite, um, providing planned or emergency uh, services, uh, and of course, to deal with the provider shortage issue, uh, training and recruitment of providers and volunteers, and that's a critical piece of this. And then finally, providing information to caregivers about respite services and how to access them. Now, the, this sounds very prescriptive, but in fact, there's a lot of flexibility in how states uh, can approach these. There are no requirements that states have to spend a specific percentage uh, on each of these activities. Um, so they are able to really focus in on where their states have demonstrated the greatest need. Uh, next slide, please. I would also like to um, lay out for you that Lifespan Respite grantees have really been serving, and I would say very successfully, uh, as a testing ground for strategies I know that you're thinking about to improve access and delivery of services. Uh, many grantees have already uh, developed statewide respite registries. Um, they've, they've tested innovative uh, ways to connect families to respite services and funding sources, uh, some through their very important par partnerships and their state respite coalitions or in partnership with aging and disability resource centers and no wrong door systems. Um, they've really worked hard at expanding respite capacity uh, through gap filling measures like funding volunteer and faith-based respite at the community level. Um, they are increasingly working with family caregivers to identify informal respite options uh, from their own networks of family, friends, and uh, perhaps integrated community supports. And then one way that uh, many of the grantees have been engaged is through respite voucher programs. I think there are 15 or 16 states that currently run uh, voucher programs. Um, they primarily target families who don't qualify for other public funding sources or where there's a particular need. Uh, and they're showing us all the, the tools and the ways to uh, deliver voucher respite services 
uh, in person and family centered ways. So we're, we're really excited to see about what states have been doing um, with consumer directed voucher programs. Uh, next slide, please. Well, I've already, uh, the first bullet on there, I've already discussed the value of encouraging the lifespan respite approach as a model uh, for states to emulate through statewide coordinated systems of respite. Um, some other publicly funded approaches might include improvements to uh, the Medicaid home and community-based services waivers. Uh, and I wouldn't have said that this was possible before, but uh, during the current pandemic, uh, temporary emergency changes to home and community-based waivers, um, primarily through Appendix K amendments to HC HCBS waivers, have been approved by C CMS that are supporting family caregivers, uh, including expanded respite hours, uh, expanded self-direction to include respite, uh, allowing payments to family members to provide in-home services, uh, including respite, um, and some expanded settings for respite as well. Um, so I would, I would think that if we could move in this direction uh, to make some or all of these flexibilities permanent would certainly go a long way to serving those who are Medicaid eligible and rely on those waivers uh, for their respite services. And, and while we're on Medicaid, um, uh, policies that help states reduce and eliminate waiting lists um, that address the direct service worker shortage uh, and can improve quality of services, such as increasing Medicaid reimbursement rates, um, similar to language that was just included in the House passed, the most recent House passed uh, stimulus bill, um, I offer also for further uh, consideration um, and discussion. And then as states transition long-term services and supports, and they're very far along in this, from fee-for-service to managed care, um, we hear often that families are very fearful that support such as respite could disappear. Uh, fortunately, um, AARP recently examined some of these managed long-term services and support plans for older adults uh, and adults with physical disabilities in 23 states and found that most are including family caregivers uh, in service planning and care coordination and are providing some services and support such as respite or caregiver education. Uh, so this is very welcome news. Um, and as states move forward with managed care, um, if we can continue to educate managed care organizations uh, about the value of respite as a covered benefit, um, this could really be another critical avenue for uh, improvement. And then I just throw out to you, um, people have been talking about Medicare for all programs, including long-term services and supports. Um, if we follow the lead in Medicare Advantage plans, uh, we might be so bold as to suggest that respite be included uh, in the Medicare program, the traditional Medicare program, um, to really reach those families who uh, do, do, currently do not have access to other publicly funded services. And then finally, uh, an issue that's been on my mind for quite a while uh, concerning end of life care um, is allowing hospice benefits. Currently, Medicare and Medicaid hospice benefits do cover respite, but only in facilities and out-of-home facility settings. And we hear from so many families, especially if they're receiving hospice services at home, uh, would prefer to also uh, have their respite provided at home um, in order for them to get a break so they wouldn't have to move their loved one out of home just to get a few days of uh, respite. Next slide, please. And then I wanted to just uh, conclude by talking a little bit about what the private sector can do. This is not all about uh, government spending for respite. Uh, it's, it's about partnerships that we can engage in. It's about working with families to uh, explore creative other ways of, of using informal uh, respite options. Um, but I, here are just a few other ideas um, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, I already mentioned that federal investments in addressing the direct care workforce uh, crisis are really critical, but we can look to a lot of community-based efforts to creatively recruit and train new respite providers and volunteers. 
Uh, for example, Lifespan Respite grantees or other state agencies have been working with community colleges or universities uh, to develop training and career ladders um, for uh, respite workers and other direct support workers that in the long term would um, help increase their value uh, to all of us uh, who, who rely on them so heavily. Um, or there are partnerships with universities uh, to use nursing students or students in other health professions to serve as respite workers or volunteers or um, complete their internship hours. And these have proved to be very stable uh, and long lasting um, respite provider relationships as well and encourage uh, the, these students to move into the direct care workforce field. Uh, also in the private sector, if I may be so bold, uh, is to talk about private insurance plans um, and, and educating them to, uh, on the benefits of, re of respite, uh, including the importance of respite to improving caregiver health and well-being and letting them know that respite can help reduce hospital readmissions and have other cost benefits. And so exploring incentives that could be provided for private insurers to offer respite as a covered benefit um, might be considered. Uh, at the same time, and uh, Lynn Frist Feinberg talked a lot about working caregivers yesterday uh, and their needs, especially given that more than 60% of family caregivers are, are in the workplace, um, that we should work with employers, educate them uh, and encourage them to offer respite services, or even just offer information about how to uh, access respite would be a huge, um, a huge benefit. Uh, we're talking about large numbers of family caregivers who uh, we really have no other way of reaching them if, if they're care recipients or they themselves are not receiving public services. They are working and we could reach them through the workplace. Uh, and so the council might consider um, convening or recommending the convening of a round table uh, of business and health insurance leaders uh, to explore uh, opportunities to achieve some of these policy changes. Uh, and then finally, um, I want to leave you with uh, the importance of uh, encouraging ways to strengthen the evidence base for respite. Uh, and ARCH is already doing a lot in this area. We did convene an expert panel on respite research, uh, and we've been pursuing uh, implementing the recommendations from the panel and have helped stimulate some new research in this area. And the importance of this is not just to help make a better policy case for respite, uh, but to provide guidance to local programs uh, and to states to help improve the quality of, of services at the local level by promoting best practices uh, and guiding states and local programs also to use data uh, for continuous quality improvement. Um, so I think in the research arena, and I, I know that Joe and others are gonna be talking about research uh, more broadly later, but um, I thought I would throw that in there uh, for continued uh, discussion. Um, so again, thank you so much for your time here. I, I know I probably uh, generated more questions than answers, uh, but I'm certainly happy to respond to any comments or questions that you may have. And I'm sorry that I've taken too much time. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Jill. Um, that, was, that was excellent. Um, you did not take too much time. and. Um, questions are always good, and in fact, we have seven of them here um, that were used to actually help formulate the presentation that you just heard, but they were also, these same questions um, were also provided each of the council members to begin thinking about. So I want to throw it open um, the discussion now um, with Jill. Um, what questions do you all have based on everything that, that Jill talked about? Um, any questions, thoughts come up as to how we may apply what she presented to our work in formulating recommendations or as we move forward with the development of the national strategy? So thoughts? Hey Greg, it's Casey. Um, I am Casey Shellum from the University of Portland in yep. Portland, Oregon. And thank you so much for this really wonderful presentation. Um, it, it really helped me to um, spark my thinking in how, um, how might we use this opportunity that we have? And, and I'm, I'm really having to shift my thinking to thinking of where we are in this pandemic is we've got to capitalize on the opportunities. And how might we be able to really think about the opportunities for expanding access to respite care 
with whatever kinds of innovations we may be able to start thinking of. And so um, I don't know if you can speak to necessarily anything, Jill, about you know what your what your work is focusing on in terms of access to respite in really innovative and creative ways. I think um, you know thinking about social support networks um, being delivered virtually is a way of doing that. But I just it feels like this could be an opportunity for us to to truly truly capitalize on on innovation in how we are making sure that the most people who need access to respite care can have that access. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that and maybe that could be a, a component that we touch on this afternoon in some of our um, conversation about drivers. Uh, yes, I, I mentioned very briefly some of the really innovation innovative ways that our respite networks um, are trying to reach family caregivers. And I, I have to say, I, I don't know if this is an ageist thing to say, <laughs> um, but in the states where we've really got some young folks involved in the provision of respite, they have just jumped on the use of social media. Uh, just yesterday, our Alabama Lifespan Network partnered with our Colorado Respite Coalition to do a live Facebook uh, presentation uh, on respite and how to access respite in your state and they opened it up uh, to questions from family caregivers uh, who were watching the live broadcast um, and they're working on getting other of our coalitions to come together live on Facebook to offer that kind of information. Um, I know that all of our providers have been, uh, our network, our grantees, our state respite coalitions have been making phone calls to the family caregivers that they know of um to check in with them and to see what it is that they might need uh, in terms of support um providing a, providing activities like bingo online to keep uh care recipients engaged so the caregiver can get a break but i totally agree this is an opportunity for us now to really think creatively about what other strategies, what other services already exist in the community or exist online or exist virtually that we can engage uh, caregivers in using just to, to be able to step back uh, from their care, stressful caregiving situation, even if it's only for 15 minutes or a half an hour and get and get that break. Um, and I think that there, we're just really at the tip of the iceberg um, and finding out what's going on out there. And we're very excited too, because we just um, engaged in a global survey uh, with our partners at the International Short Break Association uh, and the Break Exchange um, to ask what's going on around the world, uh, since this is a global pandemic, to provide respite um, to family caregivers. And all of these, they received over 500 responses from all over the world. So we're really eager um, to take all of that information and pull it together and then uh, share it with with all of you. And I think we'll have lots of other great ideas there as well. And I, as I said, I don't think we're going to be able to totally return to where we've been with traditional respite services either. Um, because respite is such a hands on type of care that there are going to be so many more considerations um, that will have to be taken into account and and we're working on that as well in terms of developing some national guidelines for respite providers on how to reopen safely and how to more safely uh, provide respite services. Thank you. Other Others on the council, uh, questions for Jill or observations based on the information she presented? This is, her. go ahead, Catherine. This is Catherine Georges, um, number four of the, um, the respite care presentation. I think that um, that is critical. It's critical um, and we can talk about it some more because in, in some of the most vulnerable and the more at risk communities, the faith-based groups and voluntary organizations have been pivotal in assisting families. Some of it may or may not be structured. I, I like to look at things having highly you know, some structure so that we don't um, have gaps so we don't fall off of what we're doing. So I think this is an area number four that we should really take um, some time and since they probably could go to the public awareness and education group or some other group in the subcommittees to kind of massage it and, and come up with some, some really uh, strategic 
or, or tactical moves that might be um, workable for, for um, really identifying the faith-based and voluntary organization. Yeah, and this is Carol Zerniel. I, I'm curious if uh, your organization has looked at any of the reframing aging uh, work. You know, I think about the brochures that our community-based organizations, including my own, put out, and we talk about living independently in our own homes, and we use independently a lot. Uh, and is there any study that says there's a correlation between this push for independence and the acceptance of help, the acceptance of respite? And I'm wondering if we have unintended consequences with some of the language that we use. Um, I'm familiar with the Framework Institute's work around reframing aging, but um, in terms of accessing respite, uh, we, we're continuously exploring um, new messages that we can use to get family caregivers to accept help a little bit earlier um, or at all. Um, and it's been a constant struggle to really come up with a uniform message that appeals uh, to everyone. Um, we did spend some time as a national organization trying to develop messages and it really, it really was left to our state respite coalitions, many of whom have developed um, some really interesting messages that seem to work well in their states. Uh, and I'd be happy to share that messaging uh, information with you. Some of them have been more successful than others. Um, and I, I think it's a constant struggle um, to come up with targeted, well-meaning, well-directed messages that really reach family caregivers um, in a meaningful way. Thank you. Jill, this is Greg. Kind of building on on that question from Carol. So, if if it may, if it might not be possible to craft a uni like a universal strategy or a universal communications and outreach messaging and strategy, would would there be some merit to perhaps thinking about how we support whether it's states or communities, um, local you know very local jurisdictions in crafting messaging around the particular characteristics of their particular populations, maybe not necessarily providing the message, but giving them the tools they need to craft that themselves? Is that something that could be considered? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's what we've also been struggling to do because I think it, it, it takes some expertise that's a, a little bit beyond what we have in terms of understanding messaging and public mm -hmm. relations. Mm -hmm. um, but I think ARP, for example, has been very successful at working with the Ad Council to come up with um, universally, more broadly, universally available messaging um, for caregivers. But even there, um, targeting to uh, specific age groups or disability groups or um, the messages do have to be targeted. And I, I think we could offer some uh, technical assistance. No. Uh, or at least provide a direction that states can go in and, and some of the tools that they can use, um, as long as we lead them to the experts who can help them craft those messages. Great, thanks. Other questions for Jill or th um, thoughts or reactions to the information that she shared with us? Uh, I this would just like to, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. This is Linda Davis. Um, from the VA, I would just like to um, reinforce the importance of um, messaging um, that you and Greg have just touched on. Um, it's um, beyond the scope of the um, task force, I think, to get into the details, but to set some principles that acknowledge that um, the um, audience is our um, is our uh, are our caregivers, but also other stakeholders, as you've mentioned earlier, the employers, and that we have to make sure that um, we are reaching them with the right message in the right way at the right time. And so um, we, um, at the VA, while we send generic um, messages out through now our texting and emails to our customers, um, we're also looking at segmenting specifically down to the hospital level and other things that can make sure that it's a timely message that doesn't get lost in noise because there's nothing worse than 
those of us who want to compassionately deliver a service, um, finding out that no one on the other end is able to listen because it's gotten um, lost. And we know as caregivers, it's so hard to just keep track of the communications with the person right in front of us or those who have to help us navigate or our eligibility, et cetera. So I think we could craft some very good principles about how to communicate effectively, um, even if we're not able to get into specifics. Thank you. There was another comment. I think somebody uh, else is. Yeah, it was me, uh, Diane Caradu. Um, yeah. What caught my eye on these questions was the, uh, which would actually go along with Georgia's comments about the uh, identifying the faith-based and volunteer organizations, was a statewide registry. With COVID-19, California developed for the essential workers a child care registry. I haven't looked at it, but it, that, I mean, it was like overnight to have the information for the workers. And having, having been a caregiver um, for a number of years, you know, your time is so precious. And if you have to look in multiple places for different kinds of benefits, you get very discouraged and you don't do it. If there was one place where all the information, the volunteers, the fate space, the um, providers, and, the, and what kind of benefits could lead to it, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, whichever ones, it would be really helpful. And maybe a caregiver would go there right away and see what kind of assistance would be available to them. Yeah, I think those states um, where, where they are partnering with their aging and disability resource centers or have um, no wrong door systems in place. Um, and very often those uh, involve very comprehensive um, online information, uh, online and phone um, assistance uh, for information and referral for all types of long-term services and supports, regardless of the age or condition of the person in care. Um, if our lifespan grantees and respite coalitions have been able to feed into those, feed in their respite information into those larger systems, that's where they really have been the most uh, successful. And there are many states that do have online um, statewide, uh, that it might be 211 services, um, but there might be something more specific to disability and aging. Uh, services, uh, information referral systems that are very well established and very far along now in many states. And the other issue that comes to mind too is, is cultural competence and how different cultures view the whole concept of family caregiving and how they, you know, perceive being supported through any type of service, including respite. And I'm wondering what are, what opportunities do we have in that regard to think about how we, whether we shape messaging or where the message come from. Maybe we, maybe where it would come from. Perhaps we're not wanting to rely solely on the caregivers to self-identify, but maybe flipping it and having healthcare providers and others be more proactive in raising the issue um, in inappropriate ways. Thoughts on that, Jill and others? Almost well, certainly when I was talking about messaging earlier, it, it, you're absolutely right. It's not always just reaching the caregivers um, to put the burden on them to self-identify and find all the services. We really have to target messages to employers, to the healthcare profession, to everyone who comes in contact with family caregivers to understand um, what their needs might be and know, and it's not just about assessing the caregiver's needs. Once they're assessed, um, whoever is in touch with that family caregiver needs to know how to hook them up uh, with those services in their community. So that's why the messaging can be so difficult because it has to be targeted to so many different um, audiences. Exactly. This is Rosemary. From, uh, I was going to make a um, add on to what you mentioned about including um, the including the um, healthcare industry in the messaging. Um, I know it's been a couple of years ago, the Joint Commission made it a part of discharge planning for any individual 
whether they actually have a psychiatric diagnosis or not, to have access to the suicide uh, helpline as a part of their discharge plans? And is it possible to have an 800 number for caregivers around respite care and other services that would be a central number that every individual that is discharged with a medical condition um, has access to that information within their discharge documentation as a referral source. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, some of our grantees and state respite coalitions um, in those states that have implemented the CARE Act, um, where some of that discharge planning um, is now required or involvement of family caregivers in discharge planning um, to make sure that the discharge planners have information about caregiver supports and respite um, that they can immediately hand over um, to the caregiver upon discharge. Um, so we've been working really hard at, at making sure in those states where, where these policies are being implemented that the grant, the right, respite people are at the table too, or at least people who are um, working to support family caregivers generally. Uh, Rosemary, that's that's critical, it's a critical juncture where we can reach another place we can reach family caregivers that we normally wouldn't be able to reach. Uh, Rosemary, that's an excellent point. Um, and something has already been in, in one of the subcommittee meetings that we had over the past couple of months, the whole issue or the whole idea of um, a, a caregiving.gov type of a central um, place has come up. And you'll see that um, in the current iteration of the driver diagram. And so there may be an opportunity to add your thoughts on that to what's already been discussed. And I'm looking in the chat box and, um, and, and Dr. Bruce Fink raises an excellent point, you know, about the importance of caregiver assessment in all of this, because it, a good caregiver assessment should ideally uncover the need for respite. And that's the opportunity for the conversation to begin. Um, and so I think that's important and that, you know, we are, we are going to be looking very closely at the role of assessment and, and how that plays into, you know, the, being able to start the conversation. Greg, this yes. is Ron. Yes. And I think tying together all the last comments, the real issue is the pieces are there. They're not linked. Mm -hmm. So you need the assessment. You need the databases that have accurate information and you need the person doing the assessment, helping the caregiver, drawing on those resources and linking them. Mm -hmm. Caregivers, just the word respite, it, 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 a caregiver coming into it doesn't even know what it is. And as I always remember, my long-term colleague, Lisa Gwyther always said, their first question is, I need a lady but they don't know what that lady's supposed to do mm -hmm. or what's supposed to happen. And so it's, I think we have pieces, but they're not linked. Yeah. And that's what we really need to do. Great point, great point. When we, when we get later on today, um, as we begin working a little bit on the, on the driver diagram, let's try to remember some of these concepts that we've thrown around here, because this has been really fascinating. And let's be sure that we incorporate them and get them back down on paper. So. Um, I'll be relying on everyone who's raised these points to reiterate them again a little bit later on. Um, I want to be mindful. Yes. Oh, uh, Greg, this is Alan. I just had, do we have time for one more question? Sure, sure. Um, uh, Jill, you mentioned towards the end of your presentation the need for more research uh, on respite care. And uh, again, being conscious of time, could, could you identify any specific area or topic within respite that you think we should focus on and maybe even to be more specific what are the variables or outcome measures of respite research should we include that are not only meaningful to the scientific community but meaningful to policymakers and payers yeah, absolutely. Um, what the expert panel focused on really was to research in the area of um, coming up with family caregiver outcomes primarily because respite is a service that may be provided to the care recipient, uh, but the benefits really should accrue to the family caregiver. So we were looking for research that identified family caregiver outcomes 
a care recipient outcomes and as you were saying, societal outcomes like cost, cost benefits. Um, we're now realizing also that what we need is some good implementation research uh, because we're starting to know what it is about a respite um, that works and which are the innovative and exemplary uh, programs out there. Uh, and we just need more information about how to implement those at the local level um, that ensures fidelity and ensures uh, that the, the quality components of the respite programs that we're talking about are being reproduced uh, in a way that is meaningful uh, when it, they're more broadly av available to caregivers in the community. So we're moving from outcome-based research to implementation research uh, that I think is going to be critical. Thank you. And I think that provides us with an ideal segue into the next portion of our agenda. And I, I believe, Jill, you're going to hang around for a while so that when we are discussing later on, if questions come up um, regarding respite and all things associated with it, that you'll still be available to answer some questions or Oh, interject. yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into the next portion of the agenda, which is um, a discussion about um, data and research. Um, and we've got first up is Dr. Um, Scott Beach um, with the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and Dr. Beach, I'm going to let you just do a brief inter um, introduction of yourself and then launch right into what you have to share with us. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present. Um, I'm Scott, Scott Beach from University of Pittsburgh. Um, I've been involved in uh, work on caregiving for many years. Uh, I have been uh, at uh, University Center for Social and Urban Research at Pitt. I work with Dr. Rich Schultz, who's a big name in the caregiving field, who has headed up the um, National Academy's report on caring uh, families caring for an aging America. So Rich has basically been a mentor and collaborated for many years. So I, I should right up front say the lot, uh, several things I'm going to say, <laughs> I kind of stole with his permission. Uh, so the two of us have been working together. Um, I also, um, currently co-director of a Nidler National Rehabilitation uh, Research and Training Center on Family Support, uh, generously supported by ACL uh, and Nidler. So that is also the connection, I think, one of the reasons I was at. I had actually thought that Joe was going to go first, but it's fine. I think our stuff's complimentary. Uh, Joe's going to talk, Joe Caldwell is going to talk about uh, survey data sets, and that's sort of near and dear to my heart. I've been I'm doing some work on the Nidler grant related to analyzing secondary data sets, trying to pull out stuff around family caregiving and disability. But I'm happy to go first. I am going to talk, uh, next slide please. Um, I am going to talk about uh, family caregiver intervention work. Now we just heard you know, a whole session on a specific sort of form of intervention, I would call it, uh, respite services. Uh, very nice uh, presentation and discussion. I'm going to take up sort of a broader view and talk more generally about caregiver interventions. Um, and the, the title that I had uh, thought about was um, Challenges and Opportunities, you know, the classic uh, uh, title for, for, for an overview. So I think there's been a lot of, um, there's a large family caregiver intervention literature. And there have been more than, as you can see on the slide, you know, more than 50 systematic reviews and meta-analyses in the last 20 years. Many of you may be aware there's a current um, agency uh, for healthcare research and quality systematic review. I don't know if it's been released yet, but it was recently done, uh, focusing on interventions for dementia caregivers. I realize that's a, only a single uh, population, but uh, they did a massive uh, systematic review of the intervention literature, tons of references, almost 600 studies. Um, Unfortunately, I mean, the major finding, with few exceptions, was that basically the evidence for the, inter the effectiveness of all these interventions is basically inconclusive. It doesn't mean that the interventions don't work or that they might not work. It's just that for various reasons, methodological, uh, practical, the evidence is insufficient to draw conclusions about what works best. There were a few um, uh, exceptions. One is uh, what's called the REACH. Uh, REACH-2 trial, it's a multi-component intervention. Uh, they looked at some collaborative care models that were effective with, uh, on a couple of outcomes, but even there they said the evidence was kind of low. So, um, 
you know, I, I think that's sort of like the bad news, but I, I think there's a lot of, we can, we can I'm gonna spend time um, looking, um, talking about um, maybe some possibilities. So someone just popped up, I saw a question, you know, what are interventions? Interventions, you know, in a very broad sense are activities, uh, programs, uh, um, tools uh, that could potentially help a caregiver or the person with a disability, the care recipient, uh, to function better. I mean, so the, the very basic in terms of interventions, basically trying to help, uh, ways to sort of uh, help caregivers deal with uh, the situation they find themselves and their care recipients. So that's, I guess that's a basic, I didn't um, think to put a, a definition of intervention, but I don't know how good that was, but um, that's basically what we're talking about. Interventions in the sense of, you know, randomized trials and so forth. So one of the things to know, the last point on this slide, the vast majority of intervention studies have focused on caregivers of older adults. And this is a, an issue that I think has probably come up in the committee a lot um, in, in other discussions. And by far, even within the older adult population, most of these interventions have focused on dementia caregivers. Okay, next slide. So there are major gaps, you know, in the intervention literature. And this is true also, I think, for the, for the observational literature, for research on caregiving in general. So the gaps, there have not been many studies of ways to help caregivers of older adults with other diseases, stroke, cancer, other chronic conditions. There has been, you know, stroke and cancer, there have been, uh, I'd say they're probably the next most popular in terms of uh, most frequently studied uh, illnesses. But you know, generally, it's dementia. There's a lot of stuff on dementia. There's a lack of other things. A big one, that second bullet, Caregivers of those suffering from mental illnesses, psychiatric issues, or behavioral problems, this is a big gap. And that's people of all ages. Um, just not much is known about it. Uh, not many interventions or ways to try and, uh, to help the, the, those people. Caregivers of younger care recipients, so the lifespan approach. And that's one thing I've really come to appreciate uh, working on the Nidler grant. I mean, I spent a lot of my career looking at caregivers for older adults, you know, and I've, I've learned a lot. And there's, a, there's just a lot we don't know um, about caregivers of parents of children and adolescents with disabilities or caregivers of younger and middle adults with disabilities, mental illnesses, traumatic brain injury, veterans coming back with TBI that need care. Um, and finally, you know, underrepresented groups. We all know that there's been very little work on focused on um, and it's true in the intervention literature, caregivers of minorities, rural caregivers is a big gap, uh, LGBT and so forth. So there's some, some major gaps, lots of focus on older adults and a lot of that on dementia caregiving. So next slide. Um, in terms of other gaps, um, this is more kind of in terms of outcomes and what people are looking at. I mean, we typically look at uh, when you do, both either a study, an observational study, or an intervention, the outcomes you typically look at are psychosocial outcomes, depression, burden, quality of life. We, we don't know a lot, there's some, but we don't know a lot on cost effectiveness, cost benefit uh, calculations in terms of caregiver interventions. And here we mean the economic cost of interventions relative to the outcomes. There's also sort of backing up into the research a little bit, um, we don't know a whole lot about the economic impacts of caregiving. We know that, you know, caregiving can, can certainly drain a family's uh, finances. Um, you know, we've done some work in our a group of uh, some of my colleagues published a paper, basically summarizing some of the literature on um, having a caregiver versus not and, and how that impacts uh, costs of care, healthcare utilization. But it's sort of preliminary, there's not a lot out there on that. Um, and as we've heard, and we'll hear, you, you probably hear repeatedly, and I'm going to touch more on this in a minute, that last bullet is, uh, is huge, you know, intervention implementation barriers. You know, we, we, a lot of these, like that review that ARC did, these are kind of randomized trials. They're done in, they're not done in settings, social service, healthcare settings, sort of real world settings. So we really need to learn 
you know, uh, how to implement things that work, you know, and there's a lot of barriers to implementation. I'll, I'll get into some of those. Um, in a the next slide. So what we do know about interventions or effective interventions, we know that to be effective, really the ones that, that seem to work are multi-component interventions and they address really two broad, two broad categories. And this will be of no I think, surprise to anyone here, but you need to sort of help, caregivers need help with both the pragmatics of providing care you know, this is where it's sort of knowledge about the illness, knowledge about symptoms, progression of the disease, knowledge about available support services. They need skills. They need to know what to do. You know, how do I actually help my care recipient? How do I assist? How do I change a, a wound dressing? How do I manage, uh, if in the case of a dementia patient, uh, problem behaviors? How do I access professional services that I need? So there's pragmatics. Then there's also a huge uh, issue around emotional, the emotional toll uh, of caregiving. Um, and this is simply the fact that it's very stressful to watch a loved one suffer, decline, um, with little or no ability to help or, or, or feeling a little bit helpless. You know, you're watching, um, you're watching your loved one um, go through things that are difficult. And so, Interventions that help with both sort of the pragmatics and the emotional toll of caregiving, um, we think, are probably most effective. And that's what some of the data shows. Um, so next slide. So this slide, I don't have a title on it, but basically what the point of this slide, I think, number one, a couple of points here. So what this list is a variety of the different types of interventions that are out there. I know this is not comprehensive. Uh, we're probably missing some, uh, but you see, that basically the way we've organized this slide, this again is Dr. Schultz's slide, I borrowed it from him. One thing, it's very difficult to classify interventions. There's so many interventions, there's a lot of different approaches and coming up with a good classification scheme has been one of the challenges. But so the way we did it here, the way Dr. Schultz did this was uh, kind of in terms of the balance of do they address the pragmatics versus the emotional toll. So let's go to the bottom first. I mean, I think so, Respite, I mean, he, he classified that as more as pragmatics. I would kind of put it, I think it does both. It certainly gives people a break, but consultation, case management, training, advice, uh, family education, palliative care, collaborative care, skills, those things tend to um, address the pragmatics of the situation a little bit more. Whereas things like uh, social support's fairly balanced or a psychosocial intervention, cognitive behavior therapy, uh, teaching people how to think differently, mindfulness, meditation, spirituality, getting physical activity, those could be seen as uh, addressing more sort of helping people deal with emotions, the emotional part of, or the, the, the you know, the, the psychological aspects. But the point is that most intervention, and you notice the top one, multi-component is sort of balanced. And the notion is that you need to address, if you're really gonna impact our, um, the life of, in a positive way, of a caregiver, of the person they're taking care of, the family, society uh, more broadly, you sort of need to address both of these aspects. And I think one of the things that's happened in the, in the intervention literature is they've been so sort of focused and customized on specific parts of, the, of this continuum that the effects they're finding, there's some benefit, but they're not maybe as, as great as they could be. So um, next slide. So, Moving forward, so in terms of kind of where we might want to go with interventions more broadly, you know, we, we do know we can understand and we can measure caregiver needs and challenges. There's lots of you know, surveys out there that Joe will talk about. There's assessment tools. There's all kinds of tools we can use to um, understand and measure caregiver needs and challenges. Uh, we, and therefore, we can identify high need, high risk, caregiver, person with disability dyads. So we can find out, we can figure out if we do a good job on assessment, which was brought up in the last um, session, um, we can understand you know, who has the most need. We can create risk or need profiles that uh, reflect caregivers' multiple interrelated needs. And these things obviously are highly variable. They, they vary across caregiving contexts, uh, across the lifespan, 
across the caregiving trajectory. Um, you know, it's complicated, but um, we can develop risk profiles that are more targeted um, that get at that particular caregiver and the dyad's needs. So basically I would argue that addressing single discrete needs with an intervention, and I have respite in there, I don't mean to, to I think it's a great, I think respite actually touches on several things as we heard last time, but things that are really focused on a single aspect of the caregiving uh, situation are gonna have, I think, less, uh, less, less of an impact. The scientific literature, you know, as the ARC uh, review shows, has basically evolved in this direction with basically, I don't know about poor results, but kind of, you know, insufficient, we're not sure yet, you know, using the traditional random RCT model has not worked too well because I think, you know, caregiving is such a complex situation. It's, we all know that it, it just can vary so much across caregivers, you know, depending on what, what the situation is, who they're taking care of demographics, uh, all kinds of contextual variables, type of disease, um, ages, and so forth. So I would argue that logic dictates that multi-component interventions adjusted for individual needs, things like REACH, uh, REACH 1, REACH 2, uh, may be sort of the way to go. Okay, so next slide. So the idea is, and this may not be kind of rocket science, but I think it's important to, to make this clear, I think and again, I think the discussion on messaging in the last session about tailored messaging, I think the same thing applies for intervention approaches. You know, we need to be nimble and have tailored intervention approaches um, to be able to sort of call on a broad array of options, like the, you know, the, the slide that I showed a little while ago that listed some of the interventions. Um, and, and, you know, available options are designed, uh, defined by these existing intervention strategies. And I think the key is, approaches that use multiple strategies, combining them in ways that address unique needs. So, you know, and of course, implementation research, you know, adapting these evidence-based intervention approaches to the unique needs of caregivers in real world settings could be um, an efficient and impactful approach to advancing the science of caregiver interventions. Now, um, as we all know, implementation is, you know, it, there's an extreme need to get caregiver interventions you know, sort of out of the, the lab or out of the, you know, these more uh, structured settings and into uh, real world settings like social service and healthcare settings. And I think it's a good opportunity, this kind of an approach to bring the caregiver into the mix, you know, the community-based particip participatory research idea, caregivers and their loved ones as stakeholders, let them help define what, what their needs are and tailor interventions in that way. Okay, next slide. So to finish up, I mean, this is sort of like the last uh, slide. Um, I think what we're proposing, and again, this is uh, Rich Schultz is a key idea. I've added a few things here, but this pragmatic intervention implementation strategy, I think is something that should be pursued, um, where you, you optimize the capacity of service providers to deliver diverse components or intervention strategies of these multi-component interventions, right? So the, 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 well, whoever you're, whatever organization, they've got to be somewhat flexible and nimble in their ability to deliver various sort of aspects of an intervention. You use risk appraisal tools to identify unique caregiver needs, both the pragmatics, the emotional toll that I talked about. And then you, 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 know, you, you, dose, you dose your intervention, both the, 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 the content of the intervention and the dosing to the risk profile and you basically have this unique combination of sort of tested strategies. I mean, I think, you know, we could keep doing large randomized trials of sort of specific types of things. I think that probably should continue. I do want to say that uh, in, the, uh, in the ARC review, they did say that given all the recent um, emphasis at the federal level on dementia and pragmatic interventions, some of those more pragmatic trials that are doing some of this stuff, I think, have not been published yet. So things may be sort of on the upswing a little bit in terms of some of the data we get out in the next couple of years. There's been a lot of sort of good work that's being that's currently done. The results aren't out yet. Um, so that's one point. And the other point I wanted to make, I want to link this stuff to obviously the, the ACL funded uh, National Family Caregiver Support Program. The, I think 
this was an excellent opportunity. To, that is an excellent opportunity to implement or to at least try out this kind of an approach that I'm suggesting. Uh, of course, you need you know more funding, but to implement, test, refine these pragmatic uh, uh, implementation strategies, you know, the evaluations of the um, NFCSP um, have shown that, first of all, relatively few caregivers, you know, are accessing this. I mean, I think they're reaching a good many caregivers with information, but actually provision of services is fairly low. One of the main things is that the state units on aging and the area agencies on aging, there's just a lack of coordination uh, for implementation, a lack of clarity about roles and so forth. So, um, you know, I think low awareness, uh, even among the agencies that this stuff's available. Um, a little monitoring of outcomes beyond, you know, uh, things like uh, they, they did show an, an increased confidence. Some of the programs have showed increased confidence, reduced burden, but lack of monitoring of physical and mental health of caregivers. But anyway, I think the, these, these publicly supported larger scale programs that pay for sort of interventions are a great way to sort of try and start implementing um, something like what I've suggested. So that's, that's where I'll stop. Uh, let, let Joe. Great, thank you so much. And we will we'll hear from Joe uh, Caldwell, and then we'll we'll open it up for discussion um, with the group. So, uh, Joe, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to pick up where where Scott left off and talk a little bit more about um, collecting caregiver data. Um, and really, really the need to do that at the national level. So if you go to the, the next slide. So I'll just start out with kind of stating the obvious that, that right now we really don't collect very much data and information about family caregivers. Really representative data or population data is hard, hard to get um, on family caregivers. There's some sources that do exist, but um, but a lot of them don't cover the lifespan. Um, so some surveys only focus on caregivers of older adults or other surveys focus on uh, caregivers uh, of children with special health care needs. Um, another limitation is in a lot of the data sets, you can't really do state level analysis. So um, when we hear from like Lynn yesterday when she's talking about the state innovation with, with paid leave or the CARES Act, it's hard to really get a handle on that because we don't have um, good caregiver data at the state level a lot of times. And then a lot of the data we collect, the sample sizes are kind of limited to really kind of be able to delve down into some populations like caregivers of people with developmental disabilities or caregivers of people with mental illness. So there's, you know, there's a lot of limitations in the data that we do have. And on the next couple of slides, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna start going into some of the surveys, but I wanna sort of um, share with the committee. I, th I think it's important not to get lost in the individual surveys, because it's a little bit like alphabet soup um, when you start talking about, you know, the BRFIS or the SIP. I think the big takeaway from this whole presentation is really um, that right now, most national surveys, um, the health surveys and the Census Bureau surveys do not include any questions that, um, that you know, get at family caregiving. So that's really the big takeaway. And as we, if we're at a committee gonna try to assess you know, over time, if, if what our recommendations we come up with, if they have an impact, we really need better sources of data to be able to track that over time. So if you go to the next slide, I'll share some of the good news of, of what does exist. And this is not at all an, an exhaustive list, but these are, these are the sources that I think, um, I, I see researchers using, I see policymakers, advocates really using and the first one is uh, caregiving in the U.S., which a lot of people have referenced. And, you know, that really is the go-to source of, of information right now on family caregivers. And the good news is, you know, they just came out with their new report last week. Um, and this is something that's done by the National Alliance for Caregiving in partnership with AARP. And they try to do it about every five years. But you know, it is a struggle to get the money to be able to do that. 
And I think it makes a statement that, you know, really one of the best sources of data uh, does not come from the federal government. It comes from, you know, these advocacy organizations. And, um, you know, while we spend billions of dollars on national surveys collecting data, we really don't have, have much on family caregivers. Um, the, the second one listed, the National Study of Caregiving, that's a study that's tied to the NHATS or the National Health and Aging Trends Study. That is a really rich source of, of information about family caregivers and researchers are using that in a lot of um, innovative ways. What, what's cool about it is you can, you can sort of look a little longitudinally at caregivers and um, you can also connect, you know, the caregiver with the care recipient and look at some interesting uh, relationships uh, between the two. But the major limitation with, with that data set is that uh, that's only caregivers of older adults. The way it's designed, it's, um, it's caregivers of uh, older Medicare beneficiaries. So, so the data set is limited in that way. And then the last one that I'll mention here is BRFIS, or the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance uh, System. And we're fortunate to have Lisa McGuire from CDC on the committee, and she's the champion um, of this. And it's, a, it's an optional state caregiver module that's, that's part of the BRFIS, but, um, but there's been a real effort over the last um, several years to get states to adopt that. And um, Lisa shared with the committee some, some recent data that um, 44 states in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico um, were able to, to collect. And, and so not only does it provide good data at the, um, at the state level, but then also this push to get, get the states to do it really provided a really rich source of data uh, at the national level from most states. So if you go to the next slide. I'm not going to delve into a lot of detail here, but I did, I did ask some other colleagues and researchers about, you know, other um, places of, of data. And there have been, um, there have been these sporadic sort of um, uh, initiatives to try to collect better caregiver data. Um, and I'll actually start at the bottom and just make a couple of uh, observations here. It, at the bottom, at the American Community Survey, this is a survey that's done by the Census Bureau and you know, it, it's an ongoing annual survey. And what's interesting is right now, there is a question in there about grandparent caregivers. So I, I think that's interesting in that, um, that now we can get data on grandparent caregivers in the American Community Survey but there's not a broader sort of question about family caregiving. So that could be a place where we could build on, on something that currently exists. Um, if you go to the top, another Census Bureau survey is the SIP or the Survey of Income and Program Participation. And I talked to some colleagues and they said that they used to do this, um, this topical module on informal caregiving um, but the SIP has been sort of redesigned uh, and they don't do the topical modules anymore and they haven't integrated any of the, uh, the caregiver questions from that topical module in the, in the new SIP. So um, that was something that was recommended that might be another place to, to sort of build on an effort that, that did exist. And then the last one I'll mention here, the uh, American Time Use Survey, that's actually not a Census Bureau survey, that's uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics Survey. Um, and it's a basically a survey about how people spend their time. And what's interesting is there are some questions in there on elder care right now. So they specifically ask, are you caring for someone um, who is older um, and you know, has a condition related to aging? And so I think that's interesting that that is in there and, you know, that could be another place to kind of try to expand uh, what they're doing to all caregivers. Um, and also to build on Lynn's uh, presentation yesterday, there's this, there's this module in the American Time Use Survey that actually does look at leave and um, if people have access to leave and if they're using leave. 
So I think that's something to, to sort of, you know, kind of delve into a little bit more. But again, it's tied right now to this elder care question. So, um, so that could be a place to kind of build on, on some things that exist. If we go to the, the next slide. I think there was one that's missing, maybe. If you could go back, maybe. And maybe not. <laughs> I think there's a slide missing, but, um, but you know, how to get there, how to get to collecting better caregiver data. The one thing that I wanted to share was um, in, in the disability community, I think, you know, a couple decades ago, we kind of faced the same situation where there was not good data in a lot of the a lot of the national surveys about disability, and there were a variety of questions about disability in different surveys that were very different. So you've got sort of mixed estimates and mixed mixed results, and there was really a push in the 2000s to try to come to agreement about um, sort of a core set of disability measures. And it started with the American Community Survey, which is a Census Bureau, Bureau survey. And they came up with these six questions on disability that are in the American Community Survey now. And through that work, what's really been interesting is these six questions on disability have been integrated into you know, dozens of other national surveys, um, health surveys and census surveys, uh, the American Housing Survey, surveys on nutrition, like across the federal government, um, these six questions have really been adopted. And I think it's something to think about because maybe that could be a model for us in terms of caregiving if we came to agreement on a set of questions, a uniform set of questions, um, that, that then we could try to do some advocacy to try to get into these various surveys um, and get the same questions into there. And so what might you know, a core set or a uniform set of measures include? Well, I think you know, it can include just some very basic stuff. I mean, Number one, you got to identify if an individual is a family caregiver. And, um, you know, there's various, like, questions in surveys that do that to, to different degrees. And so coming to, to agreement on some questions that really, um, that really get to that question in the right way. And then in addition to that, you probably want some additional, you know, basic information about the caregiving situation. So, who is the person caring for, the relationship, um, you know, the type of disability that the care recipient might have, and the level and duration of care, so number of hours a week or how long they've been a caregiver. In the research, those, you know, variables are, are really important in terms, of, uh, in terms of the supports that are needed and the outcomes uh, that uh, caregivers have. And then it'd be ideally great to know a little bit about what caregivers are doing, what types of tasks they are doing. So if we could come to agreement on sort of like a, a small set of, of caregiver type questions that, um, that we'd want to try to get into surveys, I think that could be, you know, really useful. And personally, I think, you know, we already have really good starting points in the BRFIS questions and the caregiving in the U.S. questions. I mean, they, there's su some subtle differences in, in the questions, but in general, they're pretty, they're pretty similar questions that they're asking. I think, you know, those could be great starting points to try to come together um, around a core set. And I will say just realistically, I don't think it's going to be feasible to get you know, six questions into, into all these surveys, you know, some surveys, it's going to be really hard just to get one question added that might identify if someone, you know, is a family caregiver. If you go to the next slide. So then the, you know, the question comes up, well, what, what surveys would you, you know, pick to add questions to? And it's a really tough question because you know, all these surveys exist because they get at different, they get at different things. I mean, some get at you know, get health and well-being, 
Whereas, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics or Census Surveys might get more at the economic situation or employment of caregivers. So, you know, there's, there's various surveys. And then, and then in addition to that, you got to think about, um, you know, some surveys report annually, others, there might be a supplement, you know, every, every so many years. So the frequency of how, how often you might want data and the depth of, of the data, you know, um, you know, if there's optional modules um, that might be able to go into, into more greater depth. And then again, you know, some surveys, you're, you get a national portrait, but then other surveys allow you to sort of get representative data at the state level, which is also important. If you go to the next slide. So these, again, it's kind of returning to the discussion before. I did ask people, you know, some colleagues just, um, you know, if you could, if you could pick this, your surveys, you know, you know, what, where, where would you want to, you know, get some caregiver questions added? And one of the, the most frequent ones that, that I uh, heard, and these were mainly disability researchers, but, um, but they said the National Health Interview Survey, if you could get a question added to that, that would identify family caregivers, that would give you a lot of information about, about health, employment, um, the other was the, the current population survey, um, which is a census survey. And uh, they, you know, again, like the disability community has used this one a lot in terms of, um, in terms of uh, economic well-being and social well-being and employment status. Uh, they said it would be really hard to get, to get questions into that, but there are uh, modules that are done every, every year, every other year. And so maybe it could be feasible to do, you know, some sort of caregiver module. And with Burfus, um, you know, there was this, this push to get states to do the optional, the optional module that, that Lisa and the Alzheimer's Association really kind of led the charge on. So could, could there be a way to incentivize states to do that, um, you know, routinely every five years or so, or, you know, could any of those caregiver questions be added to the core module, which is not optional, it's all states do that. Um, so that could be some, some avenues to go. And then the other two I did mention before, but you know, building on the grandparent caregiver question that's in the American Community Survey or the elder care question that's in the uh, American Time Use Survey. And if you go to the next slide, so this I wanted to throw in. This is completely shifting gears, but but the other um, you know the other place to get data is from you know the the programs, and you know like Jill said, Medicaid is really important program in terms of uh, potentially funding respite um, and information services. And one good thing, and, and there's not a whole lot we have to even do on this except report the data is that um, there has been efforts to try to improve Medicaid uh, claims data through this, this thing called TMSIS. And the good news is there are some, some elements within that new system that identify uh, respite and caregiver training. And I think this is really important because this could be reported on an annual basis. And really for the first time, we would get a sense of how much of this is actually happening in states and who's getting it, we haven't really had that data. We kind of know, you know, you know, this state might be offering respite, but we really don't know who's getting it, how much are they getting it, how much is the state actually spending on respite. So if this data was reported annually, we could kind of get a sense of that and then track that over time and sort of use peer pressure too to try to get the states that are not doing it to do it, to be like other states. So. So I just wanted to, um, to, make, to make everybody aware of that. But I would just return to the big, the big picture, the big take home, home message is that, you know, there's really in a lot of these national surveys, there's no questions right now on family caregiving. So, you know, if, as we as a council, if we can actually impact that, that, you know, would be a tremendous uh, accomplishment. And I think, um, 
you know, really start to produce a lot of research, a lot of, um, a lot of inquiry. Because if you get these questions in, it's kind of like, if you build it, they will come, you know, researchers will look at this stuff in a lot of different ways. Um, but it's just a matter of trying to get caregivers recognized enough to be included, you know, as a population in these surveys. So I'll end it there and turn it back to Greg. Well, thank you, Joe and Scott. That was incredibly, incredibly interesting and also um, surprisingly in depth for the little bit of time that we allotted a lot of you guys. So thank you very much. And as council members will, will recall, the, during the um, March and April subcommittee meetings, the topic of data and research and the need for more and better and different and bringing it together came up repeatedly. And so I'd be very interested to hear from members of the council, you know, reactions um, to what you've just seen from both um, Scott and Joe, but also questions that you may have or thoughts that you may have for where we take this information. So I'll, I'll throw it open to the group. Greg, this is Helen from ASPE. So for those of you who don't know, um, ASPE is a policy office in the office of the secretary, and we do long-term care policy research and have funded caregiver surveys for years. And I would say one of so I'm going to make two comments. One is sort of a, a challenge with the data on a federal scale that you all should be aware of as you make these decisions and have these discussions. And then the second one is an opportunity to weigh in on federal priorities. So I will say that one of the challenges with federal data is how expensive it is and how expensive the real estate is. So ACL is working now to field questions to identify people with intellectual disabilities on the National Health Interview Survey. I believe they're trying to get three questions on there and it's upwards of, you know, a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars. So for federal agencies who are working to add these important questions, know that, that um, folks are interested in them, but it really is quite expensive for the federal surveys to um, add any questions because they're long, we have challenges with response rates, et cetera. One thing that our office is doing is looking at unique platforms like um, online panels and whether we can collect information through online panels to identify people with disabilities and then identify who their caregivers are. And we could also use those panels to identify people who are caregivers as well. And then the second, I guess, more positive note I'll, I'd like to make is that um, it is just in the dementia space primarily, but NIA is convening a national uh, care and services summit this summer, it was supposed to be in March and was unfortunately rescheduled. Um, it's going to be smaller sessions. And that's an opportunity for members of the public to hear presentations about the latest research in dementia care and services and also to help the researchers and NIH identify what the gaps and opportunities are to further that research. And one of those sessions is on intervention research. So it would be great if this group could participate in that summit and help to set the agenda for NIH to improve their research on caregiving, just for people with dementia, but it's obviously um, relatable to all of the topics we've talked about today. Thanks. Great. Help. Greg, this is Lisa, and I'd like yeah. to piggyback on Helen mm -hmm. um, about the national surveys. So the National Health Interview Survey, because we're pricing out some questions right there um, currently, that's about 150, it is $150,000 per question per mm -hmm. year to have questions included on that. Um, then just to let you know related, I put something in the chat, um, CDC consulted with a staff at National Health Interview Survey, and there are several questions that are going to be fielded related to care starting in July. So basically what they're interested in is from the care recipient's perspective, they want to find out if they received any professional caregiving services, and then if that has changed due to the COVID situation, if they had a family or friend as a caregiver, did that change as part of the COVID situation? Um, and, or then did the family or friend have to provide extra care because a nurse or a healthcare professional could not provide the care during the COVID situation? Um, related to the BRFSS, yes, the BRFSS is an optional module, as we was pointed out, 44 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, yes, there are incentives given to the states to administer that question, but once again, as Helen pointed out, national surveys are expensive, so our program does pay quite a bit of money 
to the BRFSS for the rights to have our survey, our questions on their survey, in addition to providing those, um, some people call them incentives, but what it is, every time a state asks your question, it costs them money. And so we are then paying for the cost that that state is incurring for adding those nine questions that we have. We would love to have caregiving as a core question. It was a core question um, in 2009, one single question. But that's one thing is if our group felt very strongly about, it will take a lot of pressure and power needed from a group such as this to really make that happen because states own the BRFSS, they are, they vote literally on what questions are included or not included. And the real estate is the issue. Each state wants their survey to be a specific length because they are fully aware that if the survey gets over a certain length, response rates drop. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, reactions um, from folks, other questions or thoughts? on this? Great, this is Nancy Murray. Yes. Hi Scott, it's Nancy Murray at Achieva. Hi Nancy. <laughs> How you doing? Good. I'm wondering if either one of you know if there's any data that exists that um, demonstrates the impact of family caregiving or the savings from family caregiving when it comes to expenditures for Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Administration. I mean, there, there has to be some numbers out there. We've, we've got millions of family caregivers every day providing services that they're not billing Medicare, Medicaid, and the Veterans Administration for. So have, have either of you ever seen a place where we can get those numbers? There have been estimates of you know, the costs of the, you know, the caregivers, the, the, the amount of money they save the system. But I'm thinking more specifically, as to add on to some of the stuff Joe said that he didn't mention, there are a couple of surveys that, like the health retirement survey, I don't have to get back into the surveys too much, but um, that one I think focuses more on older adults, but I think there's some middle-aged folks in there too, but there's a more of a care receipt kind of focus to that one, asking people about care they've received and that has been there's a lot of spending and and uh, health care utilization stuff in that survey you can link you can link any of these surveys and not any of them but a lot of them to medicare claims data you know, we're working on some of that in our study uh, i don't know that there's a simple answer to that uh <laughs> surprisingly uh, joe i don't know do you want to weigh in, in terms no of i mean i i think i think it the the stuff you're looking for, Nancy, is is very, it's it's not there. I mean, I don't think, you know, I haven't seen great studies on Medicaid and Medicare savings. There's, you know, some studies that have shown um, that, uh, you know, supporting caregivers can reduce placements in uh, nursing homes and right. institutions. So you can kind of draw the connection, but I haven't seen like the actual you know, economic impact analysis um, on that stuff. Um, and I do think, I think there's opportunity though, and especially like working with some of the managed care companies right now, um, like, like Jill was saying, some of them are starting to provide respite. They're doing it obviously because they see the economic value of doing that because it saves them money. So maybe working with them to try to get uh, like that economic impact that you're looking for, Nancy, uh, could be a good avenue. And also Medicare, I mean, I think there should be a demonstration or something within Medicare to look at, um, to look at the impact of respite or family support on, on Medicare savings. Yeah. Greg? Uh, yeah, yeah, this, this, this is, is Ellen. Rhonda. A... Go ahead, Greg? Rhonda. Yes, yes, Rhonda. Yes, I'd like to speak to this. Um, the state of Washington, where they've been using T-Care for quite some time, did their own analysis and they did a comparison of the folks who used the 
AC, where they, the older Americans, their family's caregiver support program, which is linked to T-Care. And they did their own study and they looked at it and with a population of 2,300 people documented a savings of $10 million for the state and $10 million for the feds. And consequently, that's why they have a waiver program where CMS is paying for this program. And that, that information is out on the Washington website. And so that's, you know, and that is, I, that to, to me is, is very compelling information. And I think it's something that we may, you all may as a group want to recommend, you know, trying to expand or to study further. Um, because one of the challenges, I think, when we talk about, particularly about, you know, how the intersections between family caregiving and the Medicare and Medicaid programs is we, we don't know a lot because, the, you know, in Medicare and Medicaid, claims data doesn't identify who the caregiver is. Um, and so it becomes very difficult to draw many conclusions at all. And so part of this may be we don't have enough yet, but one of them, the opportunities becomes how can we as a group, you know, move forward these recommendations that we can hopefully build, begin to build some momentum around this? I believe okay. also that mm -hmm. Washington yeah. is also looking at the impact on Medicare. I'm not certain about where they are mm -hmm. on that. Okay. Because again, it's about funding for the research, but it, it, the state of Washington, their policy program is doing this. Okay, thank you. And this is how right, this there is, is research in this area. There's a, it, in 2010, they estimated that the cost or the value of informal care provided to people with dementia, depending on whether you counted foregone wages or if you estimated how much it would cost to provide all of those hours of care by an agency, um, the care would be valued between 159 and 215, um, I believe it's billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So $215 billion a year just for caregiving for people with dementia. Yeah. Alan, did Hi, you have? Go um, ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a couple kind of editorial comments mostly um, in that, um, you know, this is the problem I think we've run up against in caregiving for a long time is the unit of analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, we tend to be so focused on what is, what is the outcome for an individual um, but in, in caregiving, we need to be focused on what is the outcome for the unit. Mm -hmm. um, so cost may be expended in a caregiver program, but the savings associated with a care recipient, um, I actually hate those terms, but that is the way our world has worked for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, so I think there needs to be some kind of push to the movement of what is the unit of analysis that is important to the world of caregiving? Mm -hmm. It's a di directly linked to, I think Grace posted in the comment book, uh, comment box that, you know, that isn't associated in CMS data of who's the caregiver and who's the care recipient, uh, assuming that they're both in uh, a program. Um, <clears throat> you know, some effort, I think that's the first place we need to start of saying that's probably the easiest place or the, the, the the richest place to start up looking at trying to associate these uh, utilization data. It clearly that doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't tell a lot about the emotional aspects of caregiving, but at least we start to build a case from the financial um, uh, aspects. Um, so, uh, you know, that is no, no fault to anyone uh, you know, Scott and uh, many others have done great work and research in this area, um, but the field is, is progressing here and I think we're going to accelerate in an important way in how we start to do uh, uh, research in the area of caregiving. Um, uh, secondly, let me, let me just say too uh, about the AHRQ uh, report about the efficacy of, of, inter, of caregiving interventions. Um, Scott, I think you did a great job uh, describing that. It's, it was a, it's, a, it's a very well done report. 
um, and you reflected it well. With that said, I want to say that it is one data point in what we know about caregiving. Uh, and I posted in the in the blog uh, or in the uh, chat box um, a link to the evidence-based caregiving program that was sponsored by the Johnny Hartford Foundation and done by Benjamin Rose that lists a large number of evidence-based programs. Now, do they rise to the expectations of an AHRQ uh, uh, evidence base? Many of them, many of them do not. But they have shown value and, and, and Rhonda's uh, comments earlier about how her programs have shown value not only in, in the original trials but also in implement, statewide implementation uh, speak to that. And, and so just one last uh, comment here that uh, is again an editorial. I think when we when AHRQ commissions a report like they do it is applying a medical model to a social issue. Caregiving is not a disease. It's not an illness. It is a, it is a situational aspect of life. So, but when we put it into the arena of, of medical research, it gets medicalized in a way that I think distracts from us truly understanding how to research it, test it, understand the outcomes, and we lose that family-centered approach that I think is so desperately needed for the field. Mm -hmm. So, uh, lots of preaching on my part, but y'all all know this is, my, this is my passion in life, so I, thanks for tolerating me. Now, uh, if I could thank, just, go ahead. Can I respond to that a minute? Sure, sure. Um, thank you, uh, Ellen. Um, yes, I, I, it is true that you know, with the T-Care process, we have looked first originally at the impact on caregivers. What the state has done is looked at the impact on the care receivers as they've done it, and that's what we need to do. But I wanted to make one other comment on what we're talking about. And I, I think that, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was Scott or Joe made this comment. I guess it was uh, Scott. But we really need to think about when we say we need data, we need to distinguish between what we need in terms of research purposes, in terms of documenting who's out there and all of the demographics. But, we, but that's distinct from what we need to look at the impact on specific caregivers, the clinical data. And I think we need to be really sure that we're paying attention to those two differences because research level data often doesn't really fit clinical needs. And so I, I just want us to be very careful. You kind of sketched that out. I just want to make it very clear. We need to know which questions we're answering. Is it making a difference for the people or are we asking questions about who's out there and what are their needs? If I could jump in, I just want to respond to Alan's comments. And Alan, I could not agree with you more. I mean, you actually said it in a much more elegant way than I did in my slides. I think that's kind of what I was trying to say, that it's been medicalized a little bit. And that approach, you know, holding the caregiver interventions to these standards of randomized controlled trials, I think has led us down a pathway that may not be as fruitful. I mean, I think what the point is, is we know there's a lot of stuff that works. I mean, it may not reach the level of the evidence, but that's kind of what we're suggesting, that you need to think about, you know, you know, assess the person, figure out what's going on, and tailor the intervention to those, to the, to those persons, that person's needs. I mean, it's not, but I, yeah, I, I, exactly. I think the AHRQ thing is, you know, it, it's, it's held to a, it's the medical model. And I, I agree with you 100%. It's, it, caregiving is much more complex than that. You know, it's, mm -hmm. we know that. Um, every caregiving situation literally is different. It sounds cliche, but it's really true. I mean, even two people taking care of the same type of person with the same kind of basic condition, it, the situation is going to differ depending on various contextual things. So I, I, I want to echo what you said. Yeah. You said it in a way that I think it was clear, you know, your interpretation exactly kind of what we were trying to say. Well, thank you. But I mean, you, you exactly framed the issue. And I think very importantly around this issue of 
risk and what is what is the family experiencing and what do they need um, and I, I think you know thank you for highlighting that so well because uh, you, you know let me say I've been part of the problem of saying we know what caregivers need and let's design these interventions from an academic perspective and, and test them um, and that's gotten us so far but I, I think we're to the point where we now know there's this wide set of things that work We've gotten rid of the snake oil, if you will. And now we have a range of, of supports that we know to be beneficial. And it's time for us to engage the user to say, what is it that fits your needs? Not what are we gonna prescribe to you, but here's the things that, we work, that work and what is the person-centered way that you want to be uh, supported. So again, uh, I, 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 I get repeating, repeating your con, con, uh, concepts that you said, Scott, and I appreciate you summarizing. Yeah, Th thank you all. This is this has been a great discussion, and I think it, you know, it, 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 I think it bears mentioning that I don't think we're necessarily, I don't think believe we are trying to find a, a cure. For, for caregiving, I don't think we're, we would ever do that, but we could certainly adhere to, I think, the basic tenets of the RAISE Act, which is all about um, how do we recognize, um, assist, include, support, and engage. These are all very um, social type of constructs. They're not medical in any way, but they're all about how we, how we enable and support the caregiver within the system. How do we improve that system around the caregiver? Um, to make sure that they have what they need and their, their voices are heard. And so I think um, th this has just been an incredibly rich discussion. We've kind of gone a little bit over time, but I, I wanted to let this conversation go on because I realize the importance of data in what we do, particularly, you know, in, in, in the public sector, you know, data is everything for us in terms of being able to measure the success of what we're doing, the cost of what we're doing, and the impacts that we're having. Um, but we also, I wanted to shift attention a little bit because we had provided the council members um, with a copy of the most recent um, iteration of the driver diagram that we have been working on. Um, and so the version that we sent out to the council members, I don't know, gosh, last week now, um, is the, the distillation, um, I mean, I have, to, I have to hand it to Wendy and her, and her um, team at Nash P for um, really pulling together all of the notes from the two months worth of subcommittee meetings where you guys were hashing over literally every single driver and coming up with ideas on, on how we were gonna measure our success and the strategies that we were gonna propose. Um, so the iteration that you have in front of you or will have in front of you in just a minute um, as we pull this up on the screen, um, Chantal or Cheryl, if we could pull up the driver diagram, um, is all of the combined notes that we took with your input. And we had asked that you all could spend some time, um, particularly, I think, focused on um, columns C and D, but we also wanted to get your feedback. And we have about, I would say, a half hour or so minutes, 35 minutes or so, that we want to spend some time going through the driver diagram, but I think the progress we make or perhaps don't get to make today will set the stage for how we wrap up today and some of the immediate next steps. So, Wendy, did you want to sort of kick us off here and get the conversation going around um, getting people's thoughts on the driver diagram? Sure. Um, so I think our big question today is, um, so we've heard some amazing, amazing present, some of the best presentations I actually have ever heard um, over the last two days. And so I think the go-to question is based off of, you know, the, the discussions that we've had today with Jill and Scott and Joe around data, research, respite, and then yesterday around um, family leave, paid leave, and then some of our RFI findings, is what jump, really jumped out at you as to a recommendation that you think is just a must have, the must go in the driver diagram. And again, those would be basically in columns C and D. I think we've got kind of the overall drivers and the issue to topic areas, but what are your thoughts given, and they all um, gave am amazing ideas, 
What do you think of those ideas should be included in our strategies and actions and programs that need to be changed and put in the driver diagram? Hi, Wendy, this is Deborah Stonewalls. Um, one thing that kind of jumps out at me that I don't know how connected it is uh, to yesterday and today, however, in column D of, on the first page, goal one, A, number one, rather than say establish statewide caregiver resource centers to provide information to caregivers, I'm wondering if we could say expand because most of the uh, area agencies on aging, the ADRCs, the SEALs, uh, we already uh, work uh, to, a, a large part of what we do is to provide those resources and supports. And I'm wondering if in goal five, we mentioned way back at the back um, on page 15, create a caregiver friendly America toolkit. I'm wondering if that could be kind of also put in that, in that column D that actually we create a caregiver friendly America toolkit um, to establish more consistency. Dr. Beach did mention that there is a lack of coordination um, and awareness uh, across uh, the spectrum of ADRCs, uh, AAA SEALs. So perhaps that's one way we could address that lack of coordination um, that, that he referenced. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Do others want to weigh in, especially given that we have Jill and Scott and Joe, do any of you all want to follow up with something they say resonate that should be definitely in this document, given that they're on the line and can help us? This is, this is Casey. This is Mary on the toolkits. Um, is it possible to incorporate not only toolkits that are specifically for caregivers, but also for providers um, in the healthcare industry and other um, stakeholders that they could then provide or have education and information about what is readily available to caregivers? Because I don't think that information is really centralized as a nurse, a social worker, um, a psychologist, um, you know, someone in the emergency room and you're discharging someone that, you know, there's the caregiver is going to be providing temporary services until they're connected with someone in their community that can provide additional support. Great, thank you. And I think there was somebody else who also wanted to make a comment. Yes, hi, this is Casey. And I was thinking about, I honestly hadn't even quite thought of it this way um, until Alan was raising his comments. Um, but I wonder if under um, goal one, number five, in a non-health issues um, where we discuss transportation, food insecurities, I just wonder if there might be some thought around how we could pull this um, really critically important concept of the family as the unit into that area of of our of our driver that um you know and i would love to hear some thoughts from some of those who have contributed today about the the um the non-health issues i mean it's it it's really it encompasses all of those things that we're talking about that we can't necessarily be focusing on just focusing on just one care recipient or one caregiver that this is a family unit impact and i just wonder if we have space for us to really focus and hone in on that that really important of the work that i'm hoping that we can provide is that that might be a roadmap or a place for us to really call out that this is a, a focus on the unit as a whole and not just an individual. Alan, I don't know what your thoughts are on that or if um, 
you know, um, anyone else has um, things to contribute. But I just, I wonder if that might be the place for that to, to lie. This is Greg. It almost sounds, um, Casey, like you're, what I've often thought of and, and wished for was that any time uh, there's an individual in the hospital, and again, I'm approaching this from the aging perspective, um, because that's been my focus, but I would imagine that anyone um, who is in the hospital, I, at some point during that person's hospitalization, there ought to be the automatic question, you know, who, or the assumption that because that person is there, is, there, may, there must be somebody who will support them in some way mm -hmm. on, you know, and so I think looking for the assumption that there is going to be this dyad or this unit, this family unit that will need support. And then, you know, in the absence of that or ruling that out, then you know, well, okay, they, they don't have one or they don't, they don't need a caregiver, they don't have a caregiver, but approaching it with the assumption that there is somebody that's going to need support. Yeah, and I think yeah, I that's what we're missing here mm -hmm. is this, mm -hmm. this mental model of what mm -hmm. it looks like for somebody to transition from one care setting to another mm -hmm. that has this automatic assumption that we have to include family caregiving components because somebody doesn't leave a care setting and 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 have and and have the capacity to care for themselves. Most mm -hmm. oftentimes people do need follow-up care, especially right. as we've seen the declining length of stay in mm -hmm. acute care, we see a declining length of stay in post-acute care and rehabilitation care. So with <clears throat> declining lengths of stay, it is becoming even more important for us mm -hmm. to focus on mm -hmm. who's taking care of the population when they leave those care settings. Right. It's right. like the evolution I, I, of the mindset almost. Yeah. And how do you bring yeah. about the evolution of the mindset? Mm -hmm. And over and to some degree overcome the current mindset, which is and this is not original to me, but in healthcare settings, family caregivers are ignored until they're expected to do something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and that's all too, all too often the reality of uh, don't, you know, they're not needed during an inpatient care. They're only slowing things down and now it's discharge time. Now let's bring in the family because we're going to expect them to do all of these things um, from point from this point on. Um, so that's or another point of a gift. Yeah, Alan, I think you're right. Or even worse, not even thinking about the fact that they need to reach out to family. So, you know, I know that every person is being impacted in some way, shape or form from what's happening with the pandemic. But just yesterday afternoon, when we concluded our call, I got onto a call with a colleague whose father has died from COVID and his mother who is 78 years old and was hospitalized for COVID was discharged from the hospital with no follow-up plan, none whatsoever. And so he had to travel from one state to another to pick up his mother because she called, because you know they, there was no coordination of any of this. So they happened, they were there for his father. They were there as his mother was being discharged, but nobody included them. And so how is that happening? How is someone who is 78 years old being discharged from a hospital with a diagnosis of COVID-19 and not having any follow-up care coordinated? I'm not to be a selfish plug here, but I'm doing some policy updates next week uh, for GSA. And one of them is on this topic of the waivers that have been put in place that have waived all of these uh, things that we have come, we have fought for like, care planning and all that, all of those are waived. Uh, and, and there are massive gaps in how those things are being interpreted. So yes, they were done with the right intent, but in many cases, I think they do are not in the best interest of the care uh, of, of patients, particularly those going between hospital and nursing homes. Um, so uh, I think we, it's another time for just, empowering people for the personal advocacy of you can't expect people, you can't even expect the formal systems now to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you're, you as a family are gonna have to be the ones that who take this up. Um, just to, again, another editorial. I did jump in and just make a comment. This, this uh, discussion is uh, <laughs> very, I've heard this 
many, many times have thought about it. I think another opportunity is this group itself, this, this new legislation. I mean, policymakers are waking up, you know, <laughs> they're realizing that caregivers are, are important, they're, they're crucial to the system. I mean, so the RAISE Act, obviously, what you guys are working on. But before that, the CARE Act, caregiver advise, record, and enable. And they're having trouble even advising and recording. It's the enable part that I think we really need to, the, the, what, what that means is they're supposed to get, caregivers are supposed to get information on how to provide care, training. Of course, there's no, there's no guidance on how that's being done, but I know that there's lots of AARP and some groups are looking at how the CARE Act is being implemented. I mean, that's, I'll just raise that as another possible avenue um, you know, for, for looking into this, but you know, at least it's, there's some acknowledgement, right? So, um, but that enable part, enabling a caregiver to actually do what's needed once they leave that, that hospital or, wow, well, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge, but anyway, so, but there, you know, the fact that, the fact that um, some legislation has been enacted in the last five years is, it, 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 it's the bright side, but the work, you know, we need to continue the work, so. Um, this is Wendy. So uh, one of the things, Scott, that I thought you brought up, which was, which was great, was could we try to pilot some of these things? So if you gave as an example from the National um, Family Caregiver Support Program. Could we pilot um, some of the intervention research to, to see how that works? Uh, Jill, you kind of talked about, well, can we try can we try some things? And I know we have a, num a number of federal members on this council. I mean, is, are there some kind of, because um, I know this council wants to go bold, but at the same time, we also want to have short-term, medium-term, and then long-term kind of solutions. Are there some things that we could try just sort of right off the bat that would move the field forward in terms of, of, of pilots with, with things that already exist? Wendy, this is Nancy Murray. One thing that I thought about this afternoon, I forget who was speaking at the time, but in terms of working with um, a Medicaid, Medicare, MCO, um, maybe working with them to pilot the idea of service navigation for family caregivers. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, my area of expertise is with people with disabilities. And, um, you know, uh, family caregiver is now, you know, expected to go home with an adult person with a disability. And you're all of a sudden you're supposed to be experts in, you know, insurance and transportation and housing and assistive technology and Medicaid waiver services. And um, there's a lot of professionals out there, but they each have a piece of the puzzle. There's no one person who can sit down with the family and say, Okay, for transportation, we're gonna do this. For assistive technology, we're gonna do this. It's up to the family all the time to go out and you know meet with five or six different professionals to get their, their puzzle all put back together again. And um, you know, for families that where there's literacy issues, uh, there's financial issues, you know, it, it, it's impossible. And that's where things start to, to break down. So it's something I'm, I'm sitting here thinking um, that would be a great thing to pilot. So it's piloting so pilot the concept of, of like caregiver navigators. That's a right. great, yeah. I, I, I agree. I wanted to respond to that too, of the idea of pilot. I don't think we need to pilot individual interventions or programs anymore. I think what we need to pilot is the infrastructure that's needed or best supports the implementation of what we know works. And uh, uh, Greg, I'm gonna come back to you and your ACL colleagues that I think you all are the people to do this. You know, the AAAs mm -hmm. have that, are there, they have that structure. We know some of them do have done amazing work in the area of care transitions and mm -hmm. caregiving, but I think you would agree that's not universal. Um, Correct. But mm -hmm. what 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 are what's that infrastructure that's allowing some of these triple A's to exceed expectations, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we need to pilot. Okay. 
Great this point. is Melissa Gerald from National Institute on Aging, and we are currently supporting some we have some pragmatic trials. We've got some patient navigation types of trials that were ongoing and some that have just recently um, been completed. So we hope to know something about that. With respect to pilot funding, there are a few different funding mechanisms that would allow for that at National Institutes of Health. Um, one of them is you can tag on a pilot, for example, to an existing funding grant in the area of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia caregiving, this is a big area for us. And so these are rapid ways of actually getting some studies done in that area. So we talk a lot about Alzheimer's these days. And so anything that I'm mentioning would be with respect to that. We have funding programs that have uh, two-year programs five-year programs. And so these, th these things exist. And to Scott's point um, earlier with his fantastic talk, we're incredibly attentive right now to the HRQ report. That was uh, very discouraging and really a road, it's going to be our roadmap basically for how we wish to implement them because we want them to work for everybody and to know why. And you won't know why unless we know how they're operating and to have an understanding of the mechanisms. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, other thoughts, I mean, we're, we're you know, we, we've got a pretty good discussion going here, but as, as others have looked at, at where, the, at the progress we've made, um, you know, for example, we're, we're a little bit thin in column D in a lot of places, you know, are there specific actions or programs or things that we could that that we could propose as part of the strategy or as a broader recommendation that based on anything that we've discussed, whether over the past two days or in your subcommittee meetings um, to date, things that you would like to see suggested or included, I think we're, you know, we, we want to throw this open as, as broadly as possible and consider everything. Hi, Greg. This is Deborah. Yes. Um, on page three, mm -hmm. um, number, well, item four, we're right. increasing yeah. the availability of respite care options. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're we're finding it. Yep. Go ahead. It's okay. actually on page four now. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry about yep. that. Okay. Oh, we got um, it. One of the things that Jill mentioned would be um, to look at some public-private partnerships mm -hmm. um, and, you know, see if, I mean, at least try to look to expand employers' openness to respite care options for employees. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm wondering, you know, as we look at, at the issue of respite specifically, I'm wondering if there's not an opportunity to back out from the single focus of respite to a broader engagement with employers on the whole topic of family caregiving, you know, and what it means for them and their bottom line and, and the importance of supporting them. And I'm, I throw that out there for consideration as well. I, this is Rhonda. I think um, we have tried in the past, not as successfully as we'd like to, but getting a program into the employee benefits system would be really, really important. Mm -hmm. The negative that we ran into as we tried to move this direction is many <laughs> of the companies say, well, we don't have caregivers mm -hmm. um, because they don't ask for help. And my response to them is people with alcohol problems don't ask for help either often, but that doesn't mean you don't have the program. Exactly. And so part of this is, again, the outreach to employers, mm -hmm. especially those who clearly are employing a population that is clearly the large population of caregivers. We need to reach to them, A, to get them convinced they actually have these people, and then B, to see if we can't get some employee benefit programs in there. Yeah, Greg, I want to I want I want to second that um, and 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 take it further that maybe 
in a future meeting, uh, we have a presentation that is uh, very corporately based in terms of how our employers or corporations dealing with it. And um, I refer you to, uh, many of you have probably heard the reports of the work that Bank of America is doing. Uh, some very impressive work around how they are addressing family uh, uh, caregiving. So uh, I would just throw that out as a su suggestion of we hear from the corporate world. That's that's great because as you remember at the start of today, I wanted to you know for you all to provide suggestions for additional topics you want presentations on. So that is that one is noted definitely. Thank you, Alan. And I think that also links to the work yesterday from um, Lynn in mm -hmm. terms of F FML, FLMA, you know, that's mm -hmm. also good. Yep, definitely. That's what I was gonna add into Rhonda, I was just thinking about pulling in from, you know, which states are doing well, pulling that analysis into this conversation as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, pulling some of those lessons learned and figuring out how can we build from that success. And would it be possible for us to develop a, or, or foster the creation of a roadmap for other states to get to where some of the leaders are in this, in the whole utilization and implementation of FMLA? Yep. Okay. Can, can I expand okay. that to what we were saying earlier? I think there needs to be a roadmap on the public side of how do states get there and a roadmap for the private sector of how to private, how do other organizations in the private sector get to where we want them mm -hmm. um, to be. And while I'm, Talking one last comment, and then I'll shut up. Uh, Greg, you had mentioned earlier about uh, column D, mm -hmm. um, and this is a very general comment that I think will take some thought. Um, I don't think we have enough around the topic of technology okay. uh, in column D, um, to, and that's a general comment that I think mm -hmm. we can go back through and, and, and sort through, but um, clearly we've got to think better about how do we use uh, technology at, at every um, every level? So there's a, um, a very innovative company here in Texas that is using a, t uh, a app around uh, uh, respite um, mm -hmm. to provide rapid rapid selection of respite uh, providers to come to your house. Kind of uh, uh, think of Uber for uh, respite care, mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think there's some aspects of technology that even apply to, uh, or especially apply to uh, uh, respite. Thanks. Someone else have a comment? It looked, sounded like somebody else was trying to weigh in. I had a question for a follow-up for Nancy, actually, when she would, um, Nancy, if you were saying about your rapid pilots, how rapid it um, I should have asked before I was saying, oh, only 10 years from now we can do it. Isn't that quick? How quick were you thinking in your head? What did you have in mind? Um, very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. We very can't quick. do that. I think well, you should add that. You know, and I'm also sitting here, I'm thinking, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a, of a pandemic of a crisis that this country has not experienced for decades. And family caregivers, um, a spotlight is, is being shown on family caregivers. Parents who are, are now staying home with school children who don't have school to go to, um, you know, family members who are taking care of adult children with disabilities and, and parents who have had strokes. Um, Family care, in my mind, family, you, you can't turn on the, on the national or state news every night without hearing a story about a family and a family caregiver and family caregivers that are keeping this family, this country afloat right now. And somehow I think we should use this opportunity to educate Americans about the fact that we, as a society, we can't exist without family caregivers. At some point in a family's life, there's gonna be a person or a couple of people step forward to care for a parent, a brother or sister, a child. It, it, it happens to almost every family. Mm -hmm. And I think now more than ever, this would be an opportunity 
for us to put forth a lot of information and create more awareness on, on, on what we're meeting about. Thank I don't you. know how to do this. Yeah. But. Yeah, and I, you know, I think, I don't know necessarily know that we have to have the answers for how to do that, but understanding that it needs to be done. I think the how then becomes this, this, uh, this collaborative effort among p a group that is much broader than, than our little group um, here today. And, um, I'll just point out to that to that point, Nancy. Um, Alan added um, a, a new section that we added to this, which I thought was good, and it makes that exact same point around an aware, big, big awareness campaign. So that's number eight under this first goal. Um, so I just wanted to point out it's in there, and any specific ideas you have, we can certainly keep adding to that basic concept. For now, it's definitely in in there. And what we might want to do is um, this first goal is kind of getting long. What we might want to do is break it into two. So run a, one is on awareness, and the other one's on the services. This is Carol Zerniel. You know, one of the the messages that I think that we can get out that would resonate would be that everyone is living a caregiver's life right now. So is this a pandemic or is it Thursday? We can't go to the grocery store when we want. We can't go out with friends. We can't, you know, we're locked into our homes. Caregivers experience that all the time. And I think it's that, and, and we're having protests from people being locked in. They are living like caregivers. And I think that's part of the story that we need to get out. <laughs> that is so well said. That is, yeah. I like that. Beautifully done, Carol. This is Helen. I'm wondering if on this awareness and outreach, part of the challenge is that the caregiving experience is so different. So there are caregivers who are paying for a home care service and are managing the home care service and getting their loved one to doctor's appointments. And the supports that they need are going to be different from the supports that, and you all know this, a person that is, you know, around the clock caregiving for someone with significant um, ADL needs have. And that a, as we go through this, that we think about those different types of caregivers and the roles that, they, that we fill. And then the other piece of that would be, how, what are the different policies and narratives that we can give to each of them? So when you meet with employers, you know, it's not going to resonate with them that caregivers are providing all of this care and, you know, 24-7, et cetera, et cetera. What will resonate with them is, you know, you've got staff who have an older loved one or a child with a developmental disability, and they need to be able to take time off for doctor's appointments, or if there's a hospitalization, they need the supports for, their, for, for that time. So thinking about tailoring our discussion not only to those populations but then also getting the narrative out about the different ways that you can be a family caregiver and the different ways that family caregivers are impacted by employment by supports by the different types of respite that you would need depending on the type of caregiver you are and i think it, it could go a long way to resonating with more people I quite agree with Helen, and I must add one point, and that is it's not only that employers understand what, um, you know, caregivers' needs are, but care employers are also impacted by this. And so it goes uh, both ways. There are different types of employers. Some are of small businesses who are losing their labor force right now because of the lack of caregiving support that's available. Um, given that we're talking about employment and we that's come up again and again and again, financial well-being and employment, and we know that so many of the uh, caregivers are, are employed, going back to the presentation we heard yesterday around some ideas around family leave and, and paid sick leave, did those ideas, which of those ideas, because there were so many of them, I mean, even just expanding the FMLA, there are many different ways to expand it between the definitions, and et cetera. So is there anything in particular that resonated for you all that you think needs to be part of the recommendations? This is Rosemary speaking in regards to employment. We're sort of assuming that the majority of our caregivers are actually employed in a setting where they are offered some type of leave benefit but there are many first line um, employees that don't have sick leave or any type of leave benefit 
um, and therefore they're not necessarily eligible for FMLA or any other benefits. So I think they should be considered as well in this dialogue. In this Carol's journey, I think the opportunity may be to align ourselves very closely with the with the child care folks because uh, the issue of, of child care and kids being out of school during this pandemic, uh, there's a lot of discussion about child care and we don't always show up, the elder care piece doesn't always show up in that dialogue. So going back to the prior discussion, that family unit, what is it that keeps people from working? What is it that keeps people from being productive? It's both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's a good point, Carol. And I was thinking, I wonder if there's an opportunity for us to help uh, coordinate the language or nomenclature in which caregiving is spoken of um, since we have the opportunity here to work across the lifespan. So we know, uh, I would just throw it maybe as an example, the Alzheimer's Association does a great job of, 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 of public outreach around Alzheimer's. And I know other affinity groups may do the same. I wonder if there's some way of coming up and getting people to work together on some common language around this is caregiving, you know, so it, it, so it, it, so we get the mass appeal, not broken up by age or disease, but really speak to the societal issue of caregiving and get some of the national organizations to work together with that common with that goal of a, of a common message, not exclusively their message, but one that they could buy into together. This is Rosemary. I think we mentioned the cultural diversity perspective where a lot of um, individuals are living in multi-generational homes where they're having elderly as well as small children that they are providing um, care for, whether they have a medical condition or not. Um, also creates a very um, interesting dynamic for a lot of people. Um, the other thing that I was surprised to learn about yesterday was is that there's no federal law that prohibits discrimination against a family caregiver. Mm -hmm. This is Bruce Fink. Back to the, the cultural diversity issue. One of the things we see in, in Indian country um, is sometimes an um, it, it's a varying uh, interest in being identified even as a caregiver, even while structurally that's, it's just, that's what a family is, right? So we, we there was a great study, Kathy Hennessy and Rob John did years ago um, up in, in the eight Northern Pueblos, but it's, it's borne out over in, in, in subsequent sort of conversations and interviews in which folks, were, were resistant to the notion of caregiver as a role, resistant to the, certainly resistant to the notion of burden or difficulty of caregiving, but even to the role, because for them it was daughter, sister, grandson, granddaughter. Um, and, and I think, so as we talk about outreach, I think, uh, and given the pervasiveness of caregiving, in fact, <laughs> in our lives, I, I just, I sometimes find myself wondering, is there a way we can talk about this that doesn't, that doesn't specify role per se? Now for, for benefits, for, re, for, pay, for the financial thing, for aspect of it, you know, th then it, p folks take that on in a formal way, you know, th th there's sort of a link to payment if you take it on as a formal role. But I, I, I struggle sometimes with the notion of, um, of linking our outreach to the defined role of caregiver. I, I'm interested in others' thoughts on that. I think that's especially important in, in, in diverse communities or different cultures. You know, I, I like the term family care. It's not caregiving, it's what families do. This is James Sheely. Can I go back to what Alan said a minute ago about working together? Um, I believe part of the problem of working together is I can't get my piece of the pie if I'm working with you. So in the disability community, the Down syndrome group and the cerebral palsy group and the muscular dystrophy group all want their piece of the pie, financial pie, and working together. And I'm sure it's the same through other agencies that 
receive funding as well it becomes hard to do because where's my piece? And we got to figure out how to get past that stage if you're truly going to tackle a picture of caregiving across the spectrums. Thank you. Um, one last thing, this is Rosemary. I'm a big proponent of exemplars and having people have an opportunity to tell their, share their stories and their experiences um, sort of makes people that haven't had those experience have some inclination of what the challenges are and have a greater appreciation and awareness that there is actually a need um, that is very different depending on individual and their locality and the complexity of the individual, their care recipient. Thank you. This has been a fantastic discussion. Um, unfortunately, we've hit the time of the hour, yeah. but I need to turn it back to Greg to wrap it all up. <laughs> but it has been a fantastic two days. It has. Um, I, I just want to thank everyone. Um, on behalf of Lance Robertson in particular, he emailed me just a few minutes ago. Um, he had hoped to be able to get back on the call um, to thank you and to, to send us on our way. Um, but he's been called away to another meeting. So on, on behalf of Lance, I want to say thank you from him um, for, for these two really incredible days. Um, if we could go ahead and pull up the final slide, I want to, um, Chantal, I want to do a, a quick wrap up and kind of go over what we've said. And I've got a, we're going to have another question for the group here before we sign off. Um, going to pull it up. It's got some, but um, anyway, we, uh, we arrived at a couple of um, well, one key decision during, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so yesterday we decided that we are not going to have any more in-person meetings of the full council for the remainder of 2020. It's simply, um, it's simply too, uh, iffy with the, with the current pandemic situation. And, and that is certainly fine. I, I'm beginning to feel very comfortable, unfortunately, with this meeting format, although I would much rather be in person with each one of you because I think it's so much more interactive and you all are just so great that the energy you provide in a room um, I can live off of for days, but we will get there in 2021. We need to make a decision um, based on everything that we accomplished over yesterday and today. Um, though on for the next several months, do we want to perhaps meet as a full council like we did today with very targeted agendas? So um, Wendy and I could easily see um, instead of subcommittee meetings in June or July, maybe convening the council again like this instead of for so for two days and maybe have a series of targeted presentations. Maybe we could bring in presenters that could talk about employer and workplace issues and identify a couple of other topics that you all would like to hear from. And then we could structure a couple of exercises that will move you all towards um, being able to begin crafting a set of recommendations that will become part of the initial report and then do some further work on fleshing out this framework of, a dri of the driver diagram that's quickly becoming the framework for what's going to be the national strategy. So my question is, would you, are you wanting to go back to subcommittees meeting as those little groups, or would you rather have maybe a couple of full council meetings, perhaps one in mid July and another one in mid August um, or early September? Um, so we have a poll question, but I'd be interested in hearing some comments from folks if you, if you all um, have thoughts. Greg, I'll jump in and say, I, I think the last two days have been fantastic meeting mm -hmm. together. So I would really like for us to continue to meet um, as as a entire committee in, okay. in this format. Okay. But uh, could I suggest maybe, but I think, um, and, and this duration of time mm -hmm. is, is good because I think we really get a lot done. Mm -hmm. Two days back to back is probably more than I can do every okay. month. All right. Um, but like one session like we had mm -hmm. uh, per month would would fit my life. But you know, I, I, I can't I can't speak for I can't speak for others. But that's just my view. 
Sure. No, I, I think that that's valid. I think the two days in a row, while we can get a lot covered, is a big ask for, for most of us. So other thoughts before we open up the poll, just to see what folks think? Yes, Catherine. Um, I, I support the, um, the virtual full council meeting. Okay. What I liked was, and I think there are some things that can be extracted from the drivers, such as some, some issues that could be brought up mm -hmm. for the full um, committee, um, such as, you know, the Bank of America's plan and, and what mm -hmm. they're doing in helping financially and some mm -hmm. other things that came up through those discussion questions. Like mm -hmm. what, you know, we, we, there were a lot of things that came up, but we don't really know what does exist. I'm going to use the, the whole issue about faith-based communities and, and what they can do. Somebody has that data. I know they do, because I know CTAC has some of it. I know AARP has some of it, um, where somebody can present it so we can decide, do we need to make sure that that, you know, moves on and is a, a strategy or tactic that we go through. So I, I like the, the full council with the discussion um, questions that, that arise from, that we look at before we convene. Okay. Great. Um, so if folks, so the, the, the poll that's up there is for the council members only, so not members of the public. Um, and we're, we want to take the temperature. Um, so if you all could make your vote, make your selection. Um, and then we'll see what we have. Hey, Greg. Yes. Um, this is James Murtha. Sure. Um, I've been having connectivity issues all day. Um, okay. But uh, one of the things I was wondering about was like doing some kind of like maybe an maybe an oh. alternating an alternating meeting pattern, like maybe doing like one month at subcommittees, the next month it's the full council. Okay. Like, because it might be a way of like easing the commitment while also mm -hmm. like inviting more discussion just because sometimes with like full council it can be a little tough for everybody to get their thoughts in but then again having the full council has a lot of good potential for getting more information to folks and having a larger discussion okay. so i don't know just an idea i wanted to throw out before we took a vote sure sure that that makes that makes sense Greg, I like James's idea. I think there's more opportunity for more focused discussion in the smaller groups, but I also like the big ones. So alternating might be a nice idea. Okay. <laughs> we, um, yes. This is Lori. So maybe what we're asking is the next meeting that the time the council meets just for now in July, do you want to meet again as a full council or have a subcommittee meeting? And based on the input now, we can see, we can pull later whether we do an every other, see what works for people and scheduling. But um, okay. the next, next time we meet in early July, do they want full council or subcommittees? After that, we'll okay. pull more exclusively about format that we're talking about. Okay. So it looks like we, like most want to do a, a, a full council meeting um, and we would be looking in, at July. And I, th I think we're fine with, with that. And then we could then revisit this question because at that point, you know, the, the hopefully we'll be further along and getting over the, the impacts of the pandemic and we can look ahead maybe do some subcommittee meetings so if it's okay with folks we'll we'll plan a, a full um council meeting like this sometime in july um and we'll we'll select a date probably one of the the subcommittee already pre-scheduled dates um it's on many calendars um but we'll we'll reach out to you i also wanted to just talk about a second um, remind f members of the council that from um, the work that's going to be happening happening at, at UMass and Community Catalyst with the focus group and listening sessions. Council members, you will be um, receiving your invites from from them to have to that back room to listen in and to um, observe those those sessions, the listening sessions and the focus group. So those invitations will be coming your way. Um, just please remember that um, 
the the confidentiality of those sessions that you know to to not divulge you know the information that you hear. Um, we're, I'm also going to throw this out, and this may be a surprise to Wendy, um, but we we didn't I, I think get as much of an opportunity to focus on the driver diagram today as I think we had hoped. So, what I would like to suggest is that um, each of you, in light of today's of the presentations and discussions from the past two days. Um, that you take some time with the driver diagram um, and mark it up a little bit in, you know, on, you know, just in there in, in the Word document that you have, um, mark it up with your thoughts and ideas based on everything that you heard. And if you could email those back to the raise mailbox by June the 5th, um, we'll again incorporate all of your, um, all of your um, feedback and we can then begin to work on that in July. Um, we're going to continue working on the report development, as Sarah had mentioned yesterday. She's engaging with stakeholders, um, and she may be reaching out um, to you guys. And you should also feel free um, to reach out to Sarah um, with your ideas for and potential resources um, for that report. Um, I'm, I'm really thankful and, and grateful to have Sarah as part of our team. We're also, as, I, as Laurel Trailer had mentioned, um, going to, she will be reaching out to our federal partners here in the next um, several weeks. We understand that everybody, you know, across every sector, um, including the federal sector, is being impacted um, by our response to the pandemic. Um, but we are going to try to get this, federal, this inventory of federal programs um, underway in a more concerted way. And so Laurel will be reaching out to our federal partners. Um, and then as we decided, we're gonna, it looks like our next meeting will be in July. Um, it will be a full council meeting. Um, Wendy and I will get with the council co-chairs with, with um, Nancy, um, Alan and Casey to discuss the agenda and to brainstorm a little bit. And we'll come up with a, a meeting that is interactive, productive um, and, and really helps us advance the work that we're doing. Um, and then we will set the date for that and announce it. Um, any last comments or feedback before we, we sign off for, for this time? Okay, well, I wanna wish everybody all the best, um, a good Memorial Day weekend. Um, and please, please be safe out there. Um, we will then, we will be, I'll be back in touch with you and we'll send you a communication about the uh, working on the driver diagram a bit more with your ideas and the due date of, of June the 5th. So with that, we will sign off and thank everyone very much. Thanks Take everyone. Care. Thank Take care. care. Thank you. Thanks for organizing. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thanks Take care. Bye.